Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this presentation. We're going to be talking about the use of placental based allografts in the surgical setting. We have a distinguished faculty, and let me just go through them very quickly for you. From OBGYN, we have Christopher Bissell from Northside Hospital, Atlanta, Georgia. From reconstructive surgery, we have Carolyn Clark from Houston. From general surgery, Badin Das from Houston. For limb salvage, we have Anita Dua from Mass General Hospital in Boston. I myself am from Chicago. And in vascular surgery, we have Nicholas Mawad from Bay City, Michigan. So these are the faculty disclosures. And this is the program information. This is provided to you by the North American Center for Continuing Medical Education. It's an HMP global company supported by an educational grant from Memetics. These are the learning objectives, and they are to examine up-to-date recommendations and algorithms defined by expert opinion to address treatment gaps related to the use of placental-based allografts, known as PBAs, in the surgical setting. We also want to determine the appropriate candidates for PBAs in which surgical procedures to use them and how to optimize their use. We are going to evaluate the economic impact and cost implications associated with the use of PBAs in the surgical setting. So let's get started. This will be my section on foot and ankle surgery. So why would we want to even use these type of products in surgery? Well, they've been used in ocular surgery for over 35 years. Eye surgeons have reported that when using these placental-based allografts, there's no scarring of the cornea, which is a huge plus when you're talking about eye surgery. Now, we've been using them in wound care for over 12 years, and we've learned a lot about how these products work by using them in a comorbid population. In that population, they, the wounds seem to heal faster, and they seem to heal with less recurrence. There are dozens and dozens of studies in RCTs that have demonstrated the value of regenerative medicine and amniotic products in wound healing. So we take what we've learned about placental-based allografts in difficult to heal wounds and apply this to a variety of surgical applications. I've been doing surgery with these products for over 10 years. So let's talk a little bit about how this works. In the normal wound healing cascade, whether it's an acute wound or a chronic wound, this is how the healing cascade proceeds using certain chemokines, and cytokines and growth factors at various stages of the wound healing model. If we look at a chronic wound, we can see also many of these same products, these same proteins and growth factors need to be upregulated and downregulated at different aspects of the healing cascade. So we can take this and apply it to what wound healing would occur when we're doing surgery. It's the same cascade. In the chronic wound, it just moves a little bit slower, but we still need to upregulate and downregulate certain proteins and growth factors in order to get a good healing wound. Now, these products contain over 285 regulatory proteins. This is just a list of some of those proteins. And as you can see, we've already seen them in the previous slides, and there's many, many others here that come into play and are very important. As I mentioned, the regulatory proteins, some are tissue growth factors, some are protease inhibitors, some are inflammatory chemokines, but traditionally, the inhibitors of MMPs are preserved in the amnion chorea membrane and outnumbered by MMPs that are preserved in the same product by a ratio of more than 28 to 1. And so these help to close the wound faster. This is one of the reasons why they are very effective in healing wounds whether they be chronic or acute. If we look at dehydrated human amnion chorion under the microscope, we can see exactly what it looks like. The extracellular matrix is structurally intact. It contains several different collagens, elastin, laminin, proteoglycans, as well as intact cell membranes. And that's really important to remember. The cells in this product are intact. So the cell membrane is intact. And it's not an acellular product. So that helps it to work much more efficiently. 
So if we look at the dehydrated amnion coronary membrane, it provides for a semipermeable barrier that supports healing cascade and protects the wound bed to aid in the development of granulation tissue in acute and chronic wounds. This is how it's been studied. It's it's known as SMART technology, selective membrane for reparative and reconstructive tissue. And as I said, it has many, many regulatory proteins and comes in several different shapes and sizes. We have the sheet product. We have the product that already has holes in it to allow for drainage to occur. We also have umbilical cord products. So this allograph provides a protective environment to support healing, the healing process. It protects the wound bed, to aid in the development of granulation tissue. This product tends to be thicker than the amniocoria membrane product. It supports challenging closures in the comorbid patient, has over 250 regulatory proteins. What's interesting about this is that it's very high in hyaluronic acid, which is very important. It also holds a stitch very, very nicely. So when using this in deeper structures, we can actually sew it into place. And in the case studies, I'll demonstrate how I've done that in the past. Now, there's lots of publications on how these products work. Here's a publication that speaks about how these allografts increase or promote angiogenesis. So that's an interesting article to follow up with because we know that when using this, because of the amount of angiogenic growth factors that are present in these products, they do further promote angiogenesis, and this increases the rate of wound healing. We also know, this is an article just recently published, that because of the amount of hyaluronic acid in some of these products, we get a decrease in scarring. So if we can get a decrease in scar tissue, we get better healing and stronger tensile strength of the wound structures, whether it's in a chronic wound or healing of an acute or surgically induced wound. So in wound care, we've been using these products in a very, very comorbid population. When we do elective surgery, we do want the best outcomes, but these patients also have plenty of comorbidities. Many of our elective patients have heart disease, hypertension, kidney disease. They smoke, they drink, they have diet issues, and they're on a variety of medications, but we still do elective surgery on these types of patients. How about surgery on athletes? These patients sometimes really need a surgery that's going to take care of their situation as quickly as possible, heal as quickly as possible, and in all likelihood, heal with the least amount of scar tissue. So here's another indication for the use of these products. Okay, there's always a risk when we do elective surgery, right? Well, some of the stats tell us that surgical complications occur in three to 27% of all these procedures. So there's a cost to this. Sometimes the cost of a complication is five times what the cost of the procedure is or more. So if we apply the principles of using placental-based allografts from what we learned in wound healing in severely compromised patient and combine that what we've recently attained in terms of scientific knowledge and RCTs using these products for elective surgery, I think yes would be the resounding answer in should we use these in elective surgery? They're extremely cost effective. So if we understand that the cost of using these products is about maybe as low as $300 per procedure, it can be more depending on the amount of product we use. But if you compare that to the cost of a complication, which is several hundreds or tens of thousands of dollars and even increased morbidity and mortality, using these products in surgery tends to make good sense. And there are many, many physicians more and more every day that begin to use these products in surgery because they get better outcomes and fewer complications. So by using these in surgery, we can expect better outcomes. We can expect fewer complications. They tend to be extremely cost-effective. And something that we sometimes fail to understand or mention is that these products do no harm. They do not harm the patient at all when used. All they can do is help. So if all they can do is help, it makes sense that they are a viable option to use in surgery because if they can help that surgery help heal faster and with the potential of fewer complications, then 
this makes good sense and it's money well spent. So let's talk now about some of the types of surgery where I have used these products. Well, tendon lengthening is one of those areas. When we repair a tendon, either lengthen it or repair it, we wanna make sure that we get no adhesions. So we've been using these products in tendon surgery for many, many years so that we can not get adhesions and we can increase the healing potential of the tendons that we've just done some work on. So here we have a proneus brevis repair using an amion chorion membrane product. You can see in the, in the top right where we're taking a sheet product and applying it over the dissected proneus brevis. We then go ahead and we sew this into place around the proneus brevis and tuck it underneath and alongside the tendon. We then close in layers over this. And as we close, we apply a little bit more of this product in the tissue planes as we close. This allows us to make sure that fibrosis does not occur. And then this tendon, once it heals, because we fully exposed it, heals without any difficulty sliding back and forth in the tendon sheet. Here's an Achilles tendon rupture. You can tell where the yellow arrow is, where we're adding some uh, placental-based allograft to this area to make sure that that part of the tendon repair goes very smoothly. So how about using this on bone? Well, we have been able to use this on bone. In on hallux rigidus procedure, especially, is when we first started using this. In this procedure, the first MPJ joint develops some spurs. So instead of doing a, a joint implant or, say, a joint fusion, we would try to just remodel the joint so the patient would get more motion. This procedure is called a modified Valente procedure. This is how it's described when it was first introduced in 1987. And you simply resect part of the first metatarsal head dorsally and part of the base of the proximal phalanx dorsally, and it increases the amount of room there is to move that great toe dorsal plantar. So we picked a patient, of course, we always pick the most terrible patient, right? This patient, this is his fourth procedure on his first MPJ, and he was already terribly fibrosed from his previous procedures. We went ahead and did the dissection, and you can see from the, the third picture over from the left that we dissected through all the fibrosis, we discovered the first MPJ, and we resected part of the first metatarsal head and part of the base of the proximal phalanx as described by Valente. Doing that, we were able to increase his range of motion by about 50%, which is all he was looking for and is about all that we really wanted to do on this patient. We then decided to use umbilical cord. The reason why we decided to use umbilical cord because we wanted something that we could sew into place. And that's really a nice thing about using umbilical cord in surgery is you can sew it into place. It looks like once it's, it's hydrated, it looks like normal tissue. And indeed, it's exactly how it handles. So the picture on the left demonstrates us using an absorbable suture to sew this into place. We sewed it to the base of the proximal phalanx and we sewed it to the soft tissue around the first metatarsal. We then went and sewed the, the very bottom of it to the plantar aspect of the first MPJ. And the middle picture demonstrates what it looks like after we're done sewing it in place. We tried to use as little absorbable materials as possible because that would only increase fibrosis. So I wanted to keep those, the suture to a minimum. And the x-ray in the bottom right-hand corner demonstrates what it looks like afterwards. You can see there is still a piece of wire in his foot from a previous surgery. We also had to take out a screw from a previous surgery during this procedure. But what we found is that this patient was able to maintain his range of motion in his first MPJ postoperatively without any complication, without any discomfort. So we were very excited that we did this procedure and there was no fibrosis afterwards to get in the way of his range of motion that we were able to get on the table. So that was very exciting. We then went on to use 
umbilical cord products on other first metatarsal head remodeling procedures because in doing so, we can decrease fibrosis, we can keep the range of motion that we got on the table to the same extent. So we were very happy with that. This is the MRI of a patient that came into my office and his complaint was a slowly growing mass on his lower leg. So this is the MRI finding. You can see the white mass wrapping itself around the tibia and the lower leg. The picture on the left describes what it looks like at the time of surgery. And as we go ahead and make our incision and dissect out this mass, our goal was to take it out whole. And you can see that we are delivering it, literally delivering it from the wound. And the picture on the right demonstrates the mass in total. It was indeed an excision of a pigmented neurofibroma, which is a benign lesion, but very rare nonetheless. But we were left with this gaping hole in the lower leg. So in order to fill that up, we put a couple layers of amnion chorion membrane into that deficit on top of the bone. And we still expected to see some, some complications from this, such as the, the surgical site filling up with blood afterwards, quite a bit of pain and edema. As we discovered, the patient had virtually no pain. He took one pain pill the night of surgery and had virtually no edema. He kept a bandage on here. Here he is two weeks later and doing quite nicely and quite well. So we were pretty happy with the outcome of that. Another patient came in with a lipoma on his lower right leg, and we decided that we needed to resect this. And most lipomas, here is the picture of it grossly, most lipomas tend to be free floating and not really attached to too much. We discovered upon excision of this lipoma that it was indeed attached, attached to the tibia. So we had exposed bone, and in order to prevent any fibrosis or scarring down of the tissues around that area to the bone, we decided to use an amnion coronary membrane over the bone and then closed in layers over that. This patient had a great outcome. Again, very little pain postoperatively, very little swelling postoperatively. This is what it looks like two weeks later. Very, very happy with the outcome of this procedure. Here's a case of a plantar fibroma resection using umbilical cord as an implant. When we have plantar fibromas, as much as we try to treat them conservatively, many times they need to be resected. Now, when we resect plantar fibromas, it's customary to resect a portion of the plantar fascia along with it, because if we don't do that, the likelihood of reoccurrence is quite high. The only difficulty with resecting the plantar fascia along with the plantar fibroma is now you've created a serious deficit in the supporting structure of that patient's foot, the plantar fascia. So what we decided to do upon resection of the plantar fascia, and the picture on the bottom demonstrates the amount that we took out, is we took umbilical cord, hydrated it very nicely, so it got nice and thick, and then we implanted it and sewed it in the four corners and in the middle, and we used it as a strut to replicate the support of the plantar fascia. This was interesting, and we weren't sure of the outcome, but when the patient came in to see us, we saw that it was quite effective. I put the arrow on this slide so you could recognize where the incision was because it healed very, very nicely with virtually no scarring. Also, I went and palpated the patient's foot. Now, the excision was located on the medial side or to the left of that arrow. So as I palpated from lateral to medial, I was palpating normal plantar fascia and the normal tension as I palpated across there, I was expecting as I crossed the incision line to fall into a little bit of a deficit because that's where we removed the plantar fascia. However, there was no deficit. The medial side was just as firm in nature as the lateral side, which would indicate a normal plantar fascia. So I know that we resected a good size chunk of that plantar fascia. So I asked the patient if we could do an MRI of her foot. We couldn't do an MRI because she has a pacemaker. So I said, at my expense, can we do a CT scan? And she said, absolutely, no problem. What we discovered when we did a CT scan is that all the tissue planes were homogenous. There was no empty spot. There was no fibrotic area. 
the tissue planes were homogenous and the same type of tissue was present throughout her entire plantar arch of her foot. So we were very happy with this. And this patient went on to be doing quite well without any reoccurrence of the plantar fibroma. An area where we've been using quite a bit of amniotic membrane is in tarsal tunnel releases. The last thing that we want upon releasing an entrapped nerve is for it to fibrosin and we would have to go back and do it again. What we have been doing is using amniocorion membrane in the tarsal canal. Here you can see we broke it up into little bits and distributed it into the tarsal canal as we closed. We've also used umbilical cord in the tarsal canal as we closed to allow for a decrease in fibrosis and to aid us in healing these structures with fewer complications. And indeed, we've had tremendously fewer complications because this is an area prone to dehiscence afterwards. And when we use these products in surgery, we've had virtually no dehiscences and very little swelling afterwards. So we're very happy with using these in the tarsal canal. So just a few ideas and a few examples. Um, so don't do this. Don't put your head in the sand when we talk about using these products in surgery. And you'll see other indications of where these products are very useful coming up. But we're able to do things with these products that we have not been able to do before. So things that we thought were impossible are now possible. So that ends my section of the presentation. I'm gonna turn it over to the next presenter at this point. Thanks for listening. Hello everybody, my name is Dr. Christopher Basile and I'm an OBGYN in Atlanta, Georgia in private practice. I also work at a Northside Hospital, uh, which is one of the busiest obstetrical hospital and women's healthcare hospitals in the US. I am currently the vice chair of the department and in October, 2021, I will be the chairman of the department. Today, we're gonna to talk about placental-based allografts in obstetrics and gynecology. In OBGYN, the surgeries that have the most common complications in the obstetric side, there's the cesarean sections. In the gynecologic side, you have hysterectomies, you have prolapse procedures, and you have laparoscopy. And there's various complications that I will get into. This is a diagram right over here of basically prolapse measurement for all those who, who are familiar with it. And we're going to basically start with the obstetrical portion. So cesarean section, one in three women in the U.S. Uh, undergo cesarean section. Data from 2011 and according to American College of OBGYN that is still consistent, about a 33% chance. It can range up to 36% chance of getting cesarean section. There's overall severe morbidity and mortality that comes in with it, and that can be defined as hemorrhage, and that could involve as deep as getting to a hysterectomy. Blood transfusions, there's other complications that can include anesthetic complications that include uh, cardiac arrest, renal failure, uh, wound disruption, hematoma. Uh, obviously, there's many risk factors that come into play for this, and we'll get into that a little bit later. And ultimately, uh, the risk of complications, um, wound disruption, hematoma in obstetrics, that actually was increased threefold for cesarean delivery compared to vaginal births. On the gynecological side, we see hemorrhage, uterine perforation, urinary tract injuries, bowel injury, fistula formations. You can also see like complications of scar tissue pelvic floor disorders, you can see infections, you can see lymphocyst and lymphedema that can happen. And then of course, as with any surgery, some thromboembolism that can occur or hernias that can occur. And very rarely, but there is mortality that is involved in gynecological surgery, sexual dysfunction that can happen from scarring, pelvic floor dysfunction following surgery. And we will get into a lot of these uh, risk factors that can play into it as well. Hysterectomy, one of the most frequent performed procedures in the U.S. in women's health. And the majority of this being the result of symptomatic uterine fibroids. Secondarily, it's going to be due to abnormal bleeding, the most common being uh, in, the, in what I call the 40s, the magic 40s, perimenopausal and from abnormal bleeding, and then just complete disruption. Uh, we got things like endometrial ablation that can be helpful, but some people don't respond to those. Endometriosis, prolapse procedures account for the rest that are there. Uh, complications of these can include a wound abscess, can include a ureteral injury. It's one of the more common concerns is just a lot of infectious uh, uh, morbidity that can result. Some of this has been attributed as 
preoperative having BV, other things can can relate on many levels to uh, the risk factors of obesity um, and diabetes, uh, the most, some of the most common reasons why people have surgical complications. And then obviously other complications can be pelvic pain and pelvic floor disorders. So these are, from a hysterectomy standpoint, some of the complications that can occur. Then we get into pelvic organ prolapse, and prolapse is essentially defined as the descent of one or more aspects of the vagina or the uterus. You got both an anterior component, you can have a posterior component, you have a complete uterine component or vaginal component, and you can have just complete prolapse. Or, And these all can be dysfunctions due to childbirth, due to you know poor protoplasm, a lot of like tissue disorders that can play into it. And then uh, women actually, they have about a 13% lifetime risk of undergoing some type of surgery for pelvic organ prolapse. And these, of course, they can result in bleeding, infection, voiding dysfunction, fistula formation, ureteral injuries. There can be concerns with mesh erosion as well, um, shortened vaginas, and then just restriction to the, of the vaginal caliber. Pain disorders can also follow pelvic organ procedures as well. And to give everybody an idea, just the types of pelvic organ prolapse that can occur, you got the normal anatomy, you got the cystocele, the rectocele, and uterine prolapse, the anterior compartments, the posterior compartments, and, um, and then uterine prolapse can occur. And you can have all of them occurring together. So in gynecological surgery, laparoscopy also, it holds a lot of advantages and also carries a different set of risk factors uh, in addition to the common ones. Laparoscopy holds essentially smaller scars, they get faster recovery, decreased amount of intraoperative and postoperative analgesia requirement. And of course, with the not having to pack the bowels and not having to do as much as you do with uh, laparotomies, you get a quicker return to the bowel function that can occur. Um, complications tend to be a little bit more increased with genital urinary injuries in the laparoscopic world. You do also see relatively equal amounts of bowel injuries. Um, you, do, you can have incisional hernias, vascular injuries, gas embolism, and in the oncological world, port site metastases. Tend to see lower um, complication rates with high volume surgeons who are minimally invasive surgeons. They get lower overall postoperative complications and short hospital space when compared to the lower volume of surgeons. A lot of the indications for laparoscopy, they fall into pelvic pain, fertility issues, ovarian cysts, fibroids, scar tissue, uh, endometriosis, ectopic pregnancies, pelvic prolapse, and gynecological cancer. Some of the more common procedures that are performed laparoscopically, as are listed there, hysterectomy, myomectomy, sterilization, ovarian cysts, um, sterilization procedures, scar tissue, license of adhesion, endometriosis management. On more of the early obstetrical side, you see the ectopic pregnancy management um, who have failed medical treatment or are not candidates for medical treatment. And of course, uh, cancer procedures and treatment of certain infections. So surgical risk factors for complications. Many of them in the U.S., especially here in the Southeast region, we see a lot of overweight and obesity playing in, smoking as well. Um, Having the presence of an abnormal discharge, and this falls into the bacterial vaginitis or just any type of abnormal discharge that can be infectious that like opens the door to risk of wound abscess and postoperative complications that can happen. Um, hypertension, concern with perfusions of tissue, diabetes, um, severe anemia. Again, there's only one thing in the body that carries oxygen and that's hemoglobin. Well, oxygenated tissue, less likely to deal with issues. So people who are anemic, they do have a tougher time dealing with wound infections and also battling infections. Uh, people with COPD, chronic steroid use, chemotherapy, and, and of course, radiation. And then poor nutrition. These are all risk factors of peripheral vascular disease. And congestive heart failure, of course, is always a very big concern for risk factors of complications and um, morbidity and mortality uh, with both anesthesia and surgical complications. Um, risk factors for anesthesia complications are basically allergies to anesthesia and diabetes, heart disease, a lot of the same ones, the high blood pressure, the kidney, kidney problems can also be a risk factor based on processing meds. Obstetric sleep apnea, which all of us surgeons well know that how OSA can play into this. And then history of um, stroke and seizures and neurological disorders. So let's talk about the placenta. The placenta is a, a phenomenal organ. Um, it's basically the interface of the microcirculatory system from the mother to the fetus. Um, and it's where the site occurs for exchange of nutrients, respiratory gases, metabolic waste products. 
where immune protection conveys to the fetus. And it's also a source of the hormones for the pregnancy and for the developing fetus. It has, it plays huge roles in the fetal development, the protection, uh, including nutritional, respiratory, and immunologic and endocrine support. Um, and you see in the slide, it talks about three, two, one layers. It's because it starts off with three layers, the amnion, the allantoy, and the chorion. And these all eventually blend together to become one big layer. Um, there's a depiction of kind of the developing pregnancy in that picture, and, and it shows how it breaks off into the three layers. You know, all, all of us who have taken embryology knows that we, we originate from three layers. And so this is going to be kind of the foundation of where the placenta plays a role. What I thought was ironic as I was doing this was kind of similar in a healing perspective. Um, as you look at pregnancy, seminal fluid creates really a pro-inflammatory response and in the ectocervix, and that almost like begins to mitigate through a local release of cytokines and chemokines and local recruitment of immune cells, it actually triggers an anti-inflammatory immunosuppressive response in the endometrium. So by doing that, it kind of, I thought was really interesting as we look and we see the benefits as we'll get into um, of placental-based allografts, uh, because you do get a lot of that anti-inflammatory immunosuppressive response in the endometrium, and you get tissue remodeling functions that facilitates and supports embryo implantation. Again, following kind of just, you go from inflammation to proliferation as you look at kind of the development of the tissue and the development of the placenta um, to help. You get those pro-inflammatory macrophages, and then they end up developing up to anti-inflammatory macrophages. Um, and these are key to regulatory step um, and essentially allowing the immune system to promote the extracellular matrix formation and re-epithelialization. So these are changes that kind of play in to the development of the placenta on a microscopic level. Now, if we change focus and go to kind of phases of wound healing, when you look at wound healing, wound healing, and I'm just going to remind everybody a little bit about wound healing, it's, it's the physiologic process that replaces and restores function to the damaged tissue. And you start off with like a, the most immediate thing is the body obtaining hemostasis, getting the blood clot. This is through a combination of vasoconstriction, platelet aggregation and clot formation. Then you get in the inflammation and inflammatory response, and that's uh, mediated through a lot of the fibroblast laid and through macrophages, basically swelling, capillary leakage, vasodilation, and intracellular edema that occurs. And this is bringing in a lot of the um, inflammatory cytokines that are coming in and laying the resurfacing and getting everything started for building up the tissue and, and remodeling it and getting it going. So then you get to um, proliferation. And when you get to proliferation, that really comes down to angiogenesis, granulation, and re-epithelialization. Um, and then finally, uh, we get to the remodeling portion where the extracellular matrix is deposited. You get the tissue remodeling and wound contraction. And really important, this is a fluid process. So proliferation and remodeling, there's a lot of that happening simultaneously. Um, a lot of the inflammatory response right before the proliferation, that's again, looking at um, just, it's a fluid dynamic in these latter stages. So keep that in mind as we get into talking a little bit about the placental based allografts. So three big studies that I'm gonna talk about today that just kind of like help lay down and kind of bring to light the, the importance of where placental based allografts can come in and facilitate wound healing. There's been a lot of data in the wound literature on placental based allografts and how they can help. Um, hopefully I was able to lay down a little bit of a premise onto you know, where this is coming from. So this is the first one we're going to talk about, just the angiogenic properties. And this was great about talking about how it plays into the um, angiogenesis and how placental based allografts can play into angiogenesis. So as we look back, and I'm going to go back a couple slides, you can see that angiogenesis starts playing a role in the proliferation area, pro proliferation phase. So going back to the study, and with this study, basically they found that in amnion and chorionic membranes, they contain a large number of angiogenic growth factors, um, as many as 276 different growth factors that can be playing in the role in wound healing, and some of these are pro-angiogenic. Um, 
you get that the tissue can promote chemotactic migration of human epithelial cells. And this ultimately creates uh, the capability of recruiting local endothelial cells to promote wound revascularization. And the study kind of essentially showed placental-based allografts can actually both directly and indirectly activate these signaling pathways um, to help promote angiogenesis within the wound. And that essentially um, stimulates the human microvasculature and the endothelial cells that, that the allograft can increase the production of the variety of these angiogenic cytokines and growth factors. It helps the body basically, I always say, kind of like the traffic cop. And that's when I talk about this, it's, it's the traffic cop and it helps recruit you know, those local stem cells, those endothelial cells, it helps promote um, the growth factors that are needed. And that kind of traffic cops the way of like directing the tissue to grow and heal appropriately. All right, so in the study, they basically showed that these implants went from a completely avascular um, at the point of implantation to having a vascular density similar to healed skin within four weeks. That's landmark. I mean, you take a piece of tissue that goes in, it literally looks like a piece of saran wrap and you put it in and it's avascular and all of a sudden it has the same vascular density as, as normal healed human skin, which is just, it's huge. Um, they found improved healing. Um, and through one of the methods, obviously in proliferative phase, it directly stimulates that angiogenesis. Now, the other thing, and this goes along with the, the angiogenesis, it helps promote neovascularization. So in this study by Manitow, you essentially got a lot of those cytokine and growth factor expression from the allografts that they stimulate the resident cells and it recruits progenitor cells. Um, and yet at the same time, the structural component provides the scaffold for tissue regeneration. Again, traffic cop. Like love the fact that this is very similar to a traffic cop or a contractor, if you will, saying, hey, this is where things need to go. Let's, let's make the tissue better. Um, you've got the four walls of a house being built and you use that as your support network and your scaffold. And then you bring in, just recruit the local like build up along that. So this is great on how those allografts work. Um, these were using a lot of the mice uh, models and, and they found that stem cells were recruited and those um, and they were recruited to the local implantation site. Similarly, like when they compared this to um, control groups, you found so much of the previous study, you get neovascularization, um, you found greater vascularization through angiogenesis. So you get just basically a, a new foundation for that proliferative phase and the remodeling phase. And at the end of this, this provided kind of two separate areas. It recruited the local stem cells and simultaneously the scaffold for where um, this healing may occur. On the third study, uh, essentially this was showing, um, it showed regulation of some of the cytokines and the chemoreceptors that played a role in wound healing. And so you get the fibrotic response and that fibrotic response um, can have scar tissue, can have abnormal healing um, that's triggered through the TGF beta signaling pathway. And essentially with that, you get activation of that pathway, which downstream upregulates um, proliferation of the fi fibroblast and plays a role in the deposition of extracellular matrix components. Through this study, what they found is essentially that the, the placental-based allographic tissue uh, actually helps reduce and reverse some of that upregulation that can occur, and it can facilitate appropriate healing and remodeling rather than upregulate it, or it can tame that upregulation of it. So these are just different ways going back all the way to that wound healing slide where you've got factors that play in both the proliferation phase and the remodeling phase that it can help direct and guide. So putting this into practice, this is the patient I performed a hysterectomy on who also had endometriosis, did a lot of peritoneal resection that can be seen. Um, that's one of the ways I treat endometriosis through peritoneal resection. And you can see here the resection. This is the vaginal cuff afterwards. And here you can see the membrane being laid down there and all the portions that were kind of denuded or taken apart. 
When we look at scar tissue that can occur, this is what we're trying to minimize. This is just kind of evidence of scar tissue that can happen. We got omental scarring to the anterior abdominal wall. It's another version of omental scarring. So by stem cell recruitment, you can literally try to regulate the fibrosis that can occur, minimize that adhesion for formation and help promote healthy healing. This is a patient that I also did some endometriosis section. This is after about eight months of her being suppressed. She still had microscopic endometriosis everywhere. I ended up doing significant peritoneal stripping all along the posterior cul-de-sac and the anterior cul-de-sac. And again, this was kind of something that I had suppressed her. I had, when I first took her, I took her to surgery in my surgery center. And it was kind of one of those looked inside and was like, well, there's no way I can handle this in the surgery center. This was, I started with a diagnostic laparoscopy, found her riddled with endometriosis. So I did some of her endometriosis surgery. And unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't have those um, pictures to put in here, but a lot of the anterior cul-de-sac I had resected. I didn't touch a lot of the posterior because it was also coating her ureters and a lot of the vasculature here and her bowels. I brought her back to do a robotic procedure with stents and had ureteral stents in place and was able to do a lot more dissection. I suppressed her for about eight months and then we came back. And so the placental base allograft, and we'll, we'll get into it a little bit more, but um, you can already see some of the anterior parts here that were healthy. She had one hard foci right over here. And then I, I believe I have a picture of it a little more forward. Again, this is another section where using that placental base allografts can be helpful. And this was another endometriosis patient that I did, and I did a complete anterior peritoneal strip, and she had it coating the bladder walls, coating all along the front side. So you can see where I basically took out the peritoneum all along here. And this is pre-putting in the placental base allograft. So these are strips of the placental base uh, allograft that I used, and it was all placed here. Um, and this is after kind of placing it, and then I did a little bit more surgery on the backside, and then added a little bit of water to this or a little bit of saline to this. And you can see it's starting to kind of gel and kind of lay there. And this process starts that recruitment. And then this is that original patient that I had suppressed. And this is again, a picture of endometriosis surgery. Um, this is after being suppressed, you can see endometriosis riddled in her ovarian fossa. And so it stripped all of this out and was able to lay it in here. And that promotes healing. And my experience with the placenta aloe base uh, graphs, and I've been using them for about five years to give everybody kind of an idea. I find people just in general, they get up quicker, they heal better, they, they feel better. A few patients that I've done second looks with uh, or gone in for one endometriosis procedure and then come back and done another one, I just find just overall, just beautiful healing, less likely to have that endometriosis come in in areas that I've placed and, and stripped before. And I look forward to some of this. This patient I recently saw postoperatively, she initially presented with pelvic pain and severe pelvic floor hypertonicity, and she was failing outpatient physical therapy. Uh, when we originally did the surgery, she had had a diagnosis of IC, but it never ended up actually being IC. She just literally had endometriosis coating the anterior cul-de-sac and the posterior cul-de-sac as seen here. And with the anterior cul-de-sac that I was able to resect that portion in the surgery center, so a lot of her urinary frequency had gone down and never returned. Posteriorly, she was still having pelvic floor hypertonicity, which I anticipated because I never touched any of this. Tried suppressing her, seeing if it would help. And then we ended up going back for the surgery. And then here, seeing her postoperatively, even a month out, her pelvic floor is doing a lot better. It's not chronically spasming. So just simply removing that scar tissue and then promoting the healing. I've used placental-based allografts and have uh, begun to work with, um, I do a lot of trigger point injections into the pelvic floor for people with hypertonic pelvic floors and have actually used that in the trigger point in injection cocktails that I've used and have found in patients that I've had to do it a few times with trigger point injections, I've actually seen, like they come back and they say, whatever you did, it's different time comparatively. So I've got even a case series going and running right now for that to present in the future. And these are all tissue that is helping promote healing and helping promote overall appropriate 
wound management and healing. So you got different disorders, different inflammatory responses that create fibroblast uh, proliferation, scarring, adhesion formation. You got people that can struggle a lot post-surgery and you just find that using a lot of these allografts can be beneficial and be very helpful in promoting the healing. Like I said, at the traffic cop that's directing everything where to go or the airport control tower. I mean, take whatever analogy you want, but essentially they're recruiting local stem cells. They're promoting neo-revascularization. They're helping in the cascade of wound healing on multiple levels and both directly and indirectly. And they're seeing a lot of benefits from it. So you know, it's something that I would recommend incorporating in your practice if you have the ability to. And of course, being selective, you got certain situations that would do it. Like I wouldn't do it on a tubal ligation. I wouldn't, you know, certain ovarian cystectomies, I would if there's a lot of tissue taken out, minor stuff, not necessarily. You decide kind of what you are. And as you learn more about it and see where you really need a lot of that local recruitment and promote that healing, you're going to see that. As I said, I've been using this for five years already. And you just see just overall people healing better across the board. And you see less uh, postoperative pathology as well. Now I, we would move on to the next talk. And thank you very much. I'm happy to be with you. Hi, everybody. My name is Nick Mouad. I'm the Chief of Vascular and Endovascular Surgery and the Vice Chair of the Department of Surgery at McLaren Health in Bay City, Michigan. Today, I'm going to be talking to you about placental-based allografts and its use in vascular surgery. I've been involved in a lot of wound care, advanced uh, vascular and ischemic disease, and I've been very happy with the results that I've been obtaining with the use of placental-based allografts for aggressive limb salvage and pretty complicated patients. And I'm glad to share my experience with you all. This is a basic type of patient I see. As you can see, distal forefoot dry gangrene can be very challenging to deal with, particularly when you don't have enough plantar flap or enough skin to help assist in closing these type of patients or these type of wounds. So this is a general type of patient I see, and we'll go through a variety of cases. But it's important to understand that patients with a vascular disease have multiple comorbidities. As you can see here, the usual gamut of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes mellitus with poor glycemic control, renal insufficiency at times, and then, of course, continued tobacco abuse. So generally speaking, you're always working uphill, very difficult patient population, and sometimes the solutions can be quite complicated. So I always tell uh, my trainees and my colleagues that you want to set yourself up for success and make sure that you can get the best wound environment to promote healing as best as possible. Ma uh, managing these type of patients can be extremely challenging because primarily they're the patients at the greatest risk for developing complications uh, due to poor blood supply and ultimately wound degradation, dehiscence, and ultimately uh, gangrene and even, uh, unfortunately, amputation. So the goal here is to set yourself up for success. You got to have a positive attitude. Sometimes the wounds can be very challenging. Sometimes they can be worrisome. Sometimes they can be scary. But if you set yourself up for success to ensure you have an appropriate wound environment and manage as many of the factors as possible, that tends to be as helpful as you can make it. So like I tell everybody, you wanna prepare the wound environment. You can do everything correct, but if you don't set yourself up for success, you're gonna have a suboptimal outcome. Manage these modifiable risk factors as much as possible. Ensure appropriate glycemic control, make sure the wound is free of infection, debris any necrotic or fibrinous exudate, and then obviously make sure blood pressure, uh, your uh, cholesterol levels, um, and manage your renal failure as much as possible. I mean, the things that you can't manage, such as the non-modifiable non risk factors, you just can't do much about. But the ones that you can do things about, you should be as aggressive as possible to set yourself up for success. Again, when I first started using placental-based allografts, it was a very complicated patient population with exposed tendon, exposed vessels, exposed bone. And my plan really was to prepare the wound to accept a skin graft. That's really how I thought about it. I wanted to have a good granulation base to allow for a satisfactory application and acceptance of a split thickness skin graft or a full thickness skin graft or whatever may be necessary. But again, when you have bone or you have tendon, it's very difficult for you to get good acceptance of a skin substitute onto that. So my goal was really to prepare it for some sort of adjunctive procedure. But 
the more PBAs or placental-based algorithms I started using, I realized I was able to get good coverage and sometimes secondary closure with the use of this skin substitute. You can see over here to the screen right, patient actually with exposed fibula uh, following a uh, ischemic wound. Again, you want to ensure that there is good washout, make sure no retained foreign object, no retained infection or fibrinous exudate. And once that was all cleaned out, then you can start deciding what you want to do with a wound. But if you can see that the fibula or the bone itself is exposed and, or there's exposed periosteum, that's very, very challenging to close a wound or, and, or accept some sort of skin graft if at all necessary. So on a magnified picture, you can see in the mid portion of the screen, that kind of filmy uh, area, and that's application of the placental based allograft, the amnio fix onto the bone or the fibula itself. And the goal here is basically to promote healing or promote a granulation base such that ultimately an adjunctive procedure such as a skin graft or secondary closure can occur. You can see, of course, there's good bleeding uh, and there's really no retained foreign object, no retained infection or fibrinous exudate, which is extremely important because again, like I said several times previously, you wanna set yourself up for success. This is another one of my patients, again, very challenging. You can see exposed vessel, exposed peritoneum there at the level of the medial malleolus, this is the right lower extremity. And this was actually a traumatic wound. It wasn't ischemic. The patient uh, was not diabetic, did not have any uh, hypertension or hyperlipidemia or the usual gamut of vascular disease, but again, uh, exposed peritoneum, which makes it very challenging. And again, the goal here was to get some good coverage after aggressive debridement, such that ultimately we can consider the adjunctive procedure of a skin graft uh, for a secondary closure. I decided to apply amniofil, which is, you know, um, micronized uh, dehacum or dehydrated uh, human amnion chorion membrane. And uh, I apply that. I tend to put it as a paste uh, because when I use a powder itself, I find that it tends to flake off. But I apply a, a bunch of saline onto that, make a paste of that, and then apply it onto the wound after appropriate debridement, washout, and um, excision of any um, necrotic or fibrinous material. And uh, you can see that as a close-up to the screen right. That's what it looks like in a paste-type form. I got a good coverage of the entire wound. I was quite happy with that. And then you can see, actually, I tend to apply these every seven to 10 days. And uh, after six weeks, so basically three major applications or so, uh, you can see that, in fact, the wound's actually completely closed. That was the application of uh, amniofil and then the, the overlying amniofix sheet, which is um, the sheet uh, version of the application towards the right medial malleolus. Very, very happy with that. Uh, from my point of view, again, I did not have to do a skin graft, which can be a very challenging area uh, because of the mobility at the level of the ankle. And so being able to get this good coverage and ultimately secondary closure uh, via secondary intention was fantastic. And in the, the patient avoided another procedure, avoided a, a donor site um, incision and, and got good closure in just six weeks time for that pretty deep wound. I'm going to go through a couple of cases because the vascular surgery population is rather challenging, again, due to the multiple comorbidities and risk factors that they have. One of my patients here is 63-year-old Caucasian female uh, who was a two-pack per day smoker with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and coronary artery disease. And uh, at our um, uh, geographic region, we tend to get uh, referred most of the amputations, uh, even if they're not vascular related. So uh, traumatic uh, orthopedic problems, um, uh, farming accidents, of course, vascular, diabetic, and so forth, they can to get referred to us. And this patient was referred uh, for a uh, amputation, a above knee amputation due to this large wound that they felt they couldn't manage. So as a vascular surgeon, I obviously valued the patient and identified that really there was no inflow, there was no pulse. So the patient required an adjunctive uh, inflow augmentation procedure. Uh, which in her case uh, was actually a right axillofemoral bypass because that was all that she could get. Uh, and once we were satisfied with her vascular flow, the plan was then to prepare the wound bed for satisfactory a washout and debridement. And so she underwent serial debridements and washouts with obviously removal of all this fibrinous exudate you can see to the screen right. Uh, to the lateral part of the wound, you can see a large tendon uh, on the uh, anterolateral compartment, which is also very challenging to deal with. And I'll show you on the next slide. So I'm gonna show you this wound over here. Very mobile, very challenging. You can see anteriorly significant amount of tendon 
present, and obviously laterally as well, a significant amount of tendon present. So the shear forces on that can be very complicated, particularly with application of a skin substitute or a skin graft. So my goal here again was to prepare the wound uh, to accept a skin graft. Uh, such that we can have a smaller wound dimension and ultimately deal with that in that manner. So we went to the operating suite, uh, obviously aggressive debridement in an excisional fashion all around the wound itself. We did some curettage as well to make sure no retained um, fibrinous exudate. And then again, you see what you're left with, the significant uh, tendon on the anterior compartment of the right leg, as well as laterally, you can see, um, and on the, screen, the lower part of the screen there, the tendon there. So the, the challenge here is, what do we do with that? Because we know that you can't uh, have a skin graft accepted over a tendon or a bone. So my goal is to challenge uh, the placental-based allograft to see whether or not we can get an appropriate granulation tissue to allow for satisfactory um, application of a skin graft, ultimately do this large wound. And so here I use a, uh, <clears throat> a large amount of uh, amnio uh, fill, which is a powder form. And this was prior to me making more of a paste. You can see a, a bunch of it's actually on the drapes. And that's why I decided to use more uh, of a paste and apply saline to help uh, paste it onto the wound itself and have more control over the application. But we put a significant amount there to get a good granulation base, primarily distally on the leg to cover the tendons and laterally on the leg as well. And after this application, I went ahead and applied the amnio fix, which is the sheet form onto that. And the way I, I generally do it is after application of amnio fill, I'll, I'll place the amnio fix sheets on top of that. I'll sometimes perforate it with a number 11 blade to allow for good imbibition uh, from deep, deeper part of the wounds to, to, to the superficial parts of the wound. And I'm very happy with the use of the amnio fix because they come in multiple different um, sizes and varieties, which, which make it easier for me. So I, I, I preferentially like the two by 12, which is this long sheet. And this way I can apply it along the length of the tendon. Uh, previously, I used to pl place them across, so, you know, from medial to lateral, uh, but I found that with the leg moving up and down, those shearing forces would shear off the amnio fixed sheets, and now I tend to place them in the direction of the tendon itself, uh, which uh, I feel gets better coverage and, and ultimately better granulation tissue onto the wound itself. So here you can see the dehacum, dehydrated human amnion corneal membrane, allograft application onto this large wound itself. And then again, I would tend to apply a wound vac on top of this and then evaluate the wound pretty much uh, every 10 days or seven to 10 days or so. I'll leave the wound vac on. I do not remove it until uh, after that time. In my uh, practice, uh, I used to change them you know, earlier at around seven days, but I found that there was too much product still remaining. And I used to wait for 14 days then, and I found that there was, I think I lost some time. I, I, uh, I could have done it a little bit sooner to have a repeat application if so necessary. So the sweet spot for me is around 10 days with the application of the vacuum assisted closure device. And then I tend to drop it down to, you know, either 75 or 100 millimeters of mercury when I use the wound back on that. And then again, as you can see, there are seven to 10 days reapplication as necessary. I usually apply a non-adherent dressing on top of the amnio fix or a placental based allograft and then the wound vac and take it from there. And after six weeks, uh, I was able to uh, apply a um, split thickness skin graft onto the wound itself. And you can see there distally uh, towards the ankle on the lower part of the screen to the screen right. Uh, you can see that there's still exposed tendon there, but most of the wound itself is essentially covered. And we had a pretty good application of the skin graft onto that within six weeks of this large and what I would say rather challenging wound. Of course, uh, I was pretty happy with the result, but, uh, and, and this is a true story, her house caught on fire because she was smoking with oxygen and she actually burnt down her house and burnt down the skin graft uh, as well due to the heat. And so you can see uh, a little bit poor there around the wound edges, which also could be some of the application uh, of the placental based allograft. And we had to take her back, redo it all over again. Uh, I was actually running out of uh, the placental based allografts, the amnio fix. And you can see here in the middle portion of the screen how I was applying the sheet across the wound. That's just because I was running out of my sizes. But we did that. And then eight weeks after the redo, her wounds essentially all completely healed. Uh, I'm a perfectionist, so at the distal part of the leg, you can still see that there is a little bit of an open wound, but that's much easier to deal with uh, than the large uh, shifting wound that you all saw earlier uh, on the video. So this, again, with, was with the goal to uh, prepare the wound bed for application of a skin graft, and I got excellent granulation tissue over the peritinon 
uh, which again would have been very challenging. And remember, this was a patient that was referred for amputation. And uh, now all of a sudden she, ha she has her limb, of course, she needed inflow, she needed a vascular procedure, make sure the wound bed was appropriate, debrided, washed out, clean uh, before application of the placental based allograft. But, you know, this uh, wasn't any particular magic things that, you know, anybody could do with, with uh, appropriate wound care and uh, intervention. I'll show you another one of, uh, of my, my, my cases here. And this is another 61 year old male uh, who has become a, a friend of mine now, um, but hypertension, hyperlipidemia, diabetes, mellitus, and tobacco use. So the usual stuff, again, that you see with vascular patients. And he tells me that he's had trouble with his leg for one week. And this was uh, the consult that I got. So I was like, okay, well, he's got trouble with his leg for one week. Let's, let's, let's go take a look. This was his leg. Um, and, and I was like, there's no way that was there for a week. He's like, well, doc, it was there for a week. I'm like, well, I, I, I don't think so. And ultimately we come to find out that he's been having trouble with his leg for a few months. And this was the, the, uh, referral, the consult that I was, uh, asked to come see this patient. And again, the goal here was, or, or the re request was for an amputation due to the significant amount of, uh, gangrene, uh, that appeared superficial to me, but again, of this patient, uh, who was actually pre pri prior to this ambulatory. So I was like, well, again, as a vascular surgeon, my goal is to ensure that there's satisfactory flow. Let's get your blood pressure control, make sure you're in the appropriate medications, antiplatelet, statin, and so forth, and that you make sure your diabetes and your a glycemic segment is under appropriate control. And we did all that and then decided to take the case on. So with a vascular evaluation, found out that he had a severely depressed ankle brachial index uh, on the apicolateral side of 0.27. So that's severe arterial insufficiency even at rest which is not surprising given his chronic limb-threatening ischemia. And then throughout the workup as well, I identified they had a right femoral aneurysm. So was there a, a component of distal embolization um, and so forth? Difficult to tell, but the point is his flow was poor. Well, that required work. His aneurysm, his femoral aneurysm was, was obviously large enough to repair it, it achieved the indication or the threshold for, for surgical repair. And then obviously with an ABI of 0.27, we identified that he had an occluded segment with only reconstitution at the infrapalpatial position of the leg and the tibial vessel. So as you can see here to the screen left is um, the uh, right common femoral artery aneurysm and just medial to that, I'm going to use a mouse here, but uh, is the right common femoral vein. And then uh, over here to the screen right, the right common femoral artery aneurysm, the right profunda femoris and the right SFA, which was occluded. Um, and then a little bit more medially, here's the right great saphenous vein and the right common femoral vein. So uh, again, wanted to make sure we did a definitive procedure. The patient, of course, is going to require a bypass since he had occluded and non-axial flow to the right lower extremity. So ultimately, to the screen left, you can see the right common femoral artery aneurysm opened up. We did the aneurysm morphy. Uh, and then ultimately placed a um, uh, inline uh, bypass graft from the distal external iliac really to the profunda femoris uh, on the middle picture there. And then ultimately um, to the screen right, we ended up doing an in situ uh, bypass using the great saphenous vein uh, to the baloney um, tibial segment. I'll show that on the, next, on the next screen, but there you can see that on the screen right, we attached the right great saphenous vein to the um, interposition graft uh, for repair of the right common femoral artery aneurysm. And then you can see here, that's the great saphenous vein used in inside you perspective uh, down to the posterior tibial um, artery to the screen right. Actually, that's the tibial perineal trunk, frankly. Uh, and you can see the diseased calcified segment more proximal to the bypass graft. So now that we've dealt with the inflow uh, and ultimately the outflow to the right leg, now we can deal with the wound itself because anything prior to this is just not going to work. You need to make sure there's enough sat uh, and satisfactory blood flow to help you position yourself for success. And following that, after revascularization, the goal was to be aggressive with management of the wound. So you can see here over the multiple uh, pictures that are available to you, uh, debridement was performed uh, aggressively in an excisional fashion uh, with an obviously number uh, 10 blade. And most of the stuff was rather superficial, but it left you a large amount uh, of wound um, with superficial erosions. And these were done uh, sequentially multiple different times. You can see to the screen right how large uh, caking of this uh, dry gangrene uh, around the wound itself. And that was all debrided uh, and so forth. And this is what we were left with uh, after that. Multiple islands uh, of appropriate skin that you can see. Uh, I'm going to use a mouse again over here. But then 
a significant amount of eroded skin deeper than that into the subcutaneous tissue and to the fat follicles and so forth. Clearly, distally in the foot, that was all mummified and it was ultimately not viable. Um, and so the forefoot would have to be removed at some point. And so again, very aggressive debridement onto the dorsum of the foot, challenging areas to deal with and a significant amount of uh, superficial skin and uh, subcutaneous tissue that had to be removed, again, down to the fat layers with follicles uh, present. And very aggressive about all that. And then my goal here was to be very generous with the application of um, dehydrated human amnion uh, coron membrane, allograft, and ultimately wound vax as we did. And so the goal was I wanted to make sure we had satisfactory wound healing before considering a transmetatarsal amputation, because if we were not getting a good enough result, then at that point, we would have done something more definitive, such as a major limb amputation. So we went ahead with that with generous application of uh, amnial uh, fix sheets, uh, wrapping the leg as much as possible uh, to be as much coverage as we possibly can. Uh, again, being very happy with satisfactory glycemic control and good management of any infection uh, or uh, fibrinous exit that may have been present. And again, you can see to the top right of the screen uh, how there are islands of actual skin and then obviously a uh, little deeper than that, a significant amount of resection uh, of the subcutaneous tissue and the skin itself, which can be very challenging ultimately. And multiple applications were performed uh, showing you what we had left there. Again, the distal part of the foot was mummified. You can actually see a demarcated segment. I'll use the mouse again to show that to you. A demarcated segment over here and so forth. So we felt uh, that that would have to come off, but there was a little bit of a small plantar flap that could be helpful ultimately for the management of the patient. And the bottom, uh, bottom right of the screen, you can see uh, obviously the, um, uh, the uh, dressing for the bypass graft that is present there. And then here we go. After uh, the fourth week, so two uh, after a first application, uh, I ended up doing a proximal or a transmetatarsal amputation uh, that was necessary, which left us with a uh, wound uh, on the distal part of the foot. Uh, you can see tendon present there. The metatarsal heads were actually present there, and there was clearly not enough plantar flap to deal with the wound. So the goal here was to apply amniofix sheets uh, uh, very generously to help get a granulation base ultimately such that we can figure out how we want to deal with this wound itself. And then I also applied a significant amount of amnio uh, fixed sheets along the entire length of the leg itself, distal uh, to the bypass graft um, wound. And let me go to the next slide. You can see to the screen left how the sheet was applied generously. And then to the screen right there as well, you can see it's a little bit of a filmy type picture. Um, and uh, actually, if you look really close, you can see that it, it's the, the letters up or UP are there because there's an, an appropriate way to apply these. But again, the goal here was not to close the wound, but the goal here was to be able to get good enough coverage such that ultimately, if we had to do it, put a skin graft onto that, we were able to manage this distally and ultimately, hopefully, salvage the limb. But the goal, again, was to make sure we had satisfactory uptake uh, previously. And then here again, uh, this is before application of the non-adherent dressing, but again, a large and generous amount of placental-based allograft using the amniofix sheets onto the wound itself. And this is generally my uh, technique to apply this over areas that I'm worried about or concerned about to get a, get a good granulation base, and then ultimately apply a non-adherent dressing on top of that, uh, and then follow that by a wound back. And uh, you can see there, that's how we end up doing, applying a very generous amount of non-adherent dressing over the uh, placental-based allograft, and then ultimately the application of a wound vac, which I find to be very challenging sometimes with these uh, uh, bizarre configurations. And so I'm proud of my team. They're pretty good at that. <laughs> and uh, we applied that, applied the suction again, not at the usual 150, usually I tend to drop it to 75 or 100. And then you can see that, and then all the way around the leg itself, um, and then uh, initiate that, make sure no leak and satisfactory suction. Every two weeks, evaluate that in clinic is the way that uh, my technique is. And um, after the 10th week, um, you can see there that this is what it started looking like. We started getting good uh, healing. Uh, and after this 10 weeks of this wound, so just you know over two months, and then I'll show you uh, after that, the distal part of the foot itself has started to close up. There's really no significant amount of 
cratering anymore. If you look to the screen left, and I'll use my mouse over here again, again, most of the leg itself is healed up and new skins come on. And this is again, without even an application of a skin graft yet. This is just with the application of the amniofix placental based allograft um, with obviously wound care and uh, use of a vacuum assisted closure device. And then here we go after the 10th week, most of it's filled up quite nicely. Uh, itself. And now if we wanted to help go ahead with secondary uh, coverage with a skin graft, if at all necessary, we could do that. But compared to what we started with, I was very, very happy with the result. And especially again, don't forget distally at the level of the forefoot that was resected, all that's essentially been covered up. And now we're having good uh, uh, coverage with skin and, and good secondary closure. And this is what the plantar aspect of the foot looks like. Uh, again, the there was a transmetatorphal amputation, as you can see, but again, this was just with the use of placental-based allografts and what I consider a relatively short amount of time with wound care and, of course, adequate vascular flow. So uh, this could be done uh, just on my own. It's a team effort. Uh, I really do believe that these results are uh, reproducible, uh, and I've been very, very happy with the use of these and has become my go-to for the management of complex uh, wounds and even more... Um, simpler wounds, I guess, to help decrease healing time in my practice, particularly in difficult wounds that have uh, peritinon or bone or not enough flap. And um, again, with that, I, I want to thank you all for your attention. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to the next faculty. And uh, I, I really appreciate uh, uh, you guys tuning in. And please don't hesitate to get a hold of me if I could have be of any help at any time. And thank you again for your attention. And, and I'll pass it on to the next faculty. I'll be presenting placental-based allografts and reconstructive surgery applications from a private practice plastic surgery perspective. I use the placental-based allografts in multiple areas of reconstruction. My practice does a ton of cancer-based reconstruction, trauma reconstruction, as well as Mohs resection reconstruction. And so I use these products from head to toe in patients that have some reason why they would have difficulty healing or in patients that I can't otherwise employ the appropriate surgery from a reconstructive ladder perspective. So once something gets in my way for a good outcome, then I look to adjunctive things like placental-based allografts to improve my results and help reduce my risk of failure for these patients. We'll start with a gentleman who actually doesn't fit my typical patient profile. He doesn't have any other medical comorbidities that would make me think about placental-based allografts other than the large defect located centrally in a very cosmetically undesirable place on his forehead. And this is a three and a half by four and a half centimeter defect after a Mohs resection of a basal cell carcinoma. And so he presents to me with negative margins about two days after the resection, and we start to plan his reconstruction at that time. So we take the patient to the operating room and debride sort of that fibrinous exudate that's at the base of the wound from his original surgery. And that's what we have at the base. So he's got nice, healthy granulation tissue and a wound that ultimately could heal by secondary intention if I were to leave it to its own devices, but that would distort his brows and his forehead and leave sort of the central circular tight scar appearance that would not be cosmetically desirable for a young gentleman. And so we decided to take a staged approach to see if we could make this as small as possible and place all of his scars in cosmetically desirable orientations and locations. At the first stage of surgery, I take him to the operating room and circumferentially undermine and place a purse string suture around the skin so I can close that defect as much as possible and take advantage of some mechanical creep over the next couple of weeks and let that glabellar area, which is closed by primary intention, heal. And at the base of this, I use amniocord. Not because this wound necessarily needs it to heal from the bottom up, I'm not going to be asking it to heal by secondary intention or re epithelialize on its own. But I don't want the edges of the skin to roll in and create a new edge um, that's been somewhat epithelialized. I want everything to sort of start to heal at the same level to keep everything flush so that when I close his wound, he doesn't have any indentions that are abnormal, especially in a vertical orientation in the middle of his forehead. So in this gentleman, we used 
um, a dehydrated human umbilical cord that measured three by five centimeters and placed a bolster dressing over it. This is the wound once it's finally closed down with the purse string suture over that graft and it's two by two and a half centimeters. So we've gotten a good amount of improvement and closure just on this first stage. And this is the bolster dressing that I apply just like I would over a skin graft and leave that in place for one week when he follows up in my office. And this is him in the office one week later. So now the wound is 1.75 by 2.5 centimeters, which is a huge improvement. So I place another occlusive dressing on it and let it heal for another week on its own. And you can see that the base is more shallow at two weeks and we've decreased in size now to one and a half by two and a half centimeters, which is going to be much easier for me to close with an adjacent tissue transfer and get nice orientation of my scarring. By the time we get to the operating room two and a half weeks later, um, he's done three days of wet to, dry, wet to dry dressing changes and we've reduced the size of the overall wound by four centimeters. So this is something that I can't get closed primarily um, without any additional back cuts, but he's got a nice place for me to place those just above his eyebrows. And he started with a little bit of brow asymmetry. And so this gives me a chance to actually give him a little bit of a right brow lift um, and see if I can improve his baseline facial symmetry at the same time as closing his wound. These are the flaps elevated and then advanced toward the midline. And already just with the release of that, you see his brows come up just a little bit. And we perform an O to T closure. And that's his final scar pattern. And this is him at one, three and six weeks. I've seen him since at the 12 week mark and he actually has even more improvement, but he's got a nice hidden scar and for the most part in the horizontal direction. And we'll hopefully see that vertical scar continue to fade, but he doesn't have any contour abnormalities that we have to deal with or address in the future. This is another Mohs patient who's actually quite the opposite of the first patient and somebody who I would start looking for help and ways to make this wound heal from the very beginning. And that's what I did. So when I met him, he was already 10 weeks out from a Mohs excision that took seven stages. That was a long day for him in the operating room with his dermatologist. And they removed a squamous cell carcinoma and used Epifix in an attempt to get some sort of granulation tissue at the base of this. That's denuded bone without any uh, peri periosteum over it and everything's dried out. And when I see him in the beginning, I don't know if this bone is alive or dead. The patient is a smoker. He doesn't want anything to do with discussions of reconstruction in the forms of adjacent tissue transfers or local flaps. He won't really entertain the idea of even a skin graft at this point. And at this point, I don't know that I have a base that I can successfully skin graft until I know the condition of that bone that's now been exposed for 10 weeks. So we first did a week of discussion and got the patient to quit smoking and additionally start taking in 100 grams of protein daily. His diet um, on review of his history was not stellar. And so we talked about changing some things about his diet, adding some additional protein and stopping the nicotine to see what would happen and also sort of start to develop a trusting relationship because the patient was not prepared to allow me to do any surgery or intervention on our first meeting. And this is him when he comes back a week later. So lack of nicotine and addition of protein certainly helps. We've got more granulation tissue centrally and that's encouraging, but I still don't know about the health of that bone over the entirety of the surface area. And we haven't made leaps and bounds in that one week in terms of getting it completely healed. So at this point, he trusts me a little bit more um, despite being angry about being off of his cigarettes, but now he's ready to proceed to the operating room and we discuss debridement of the base and burring down of that bone to see if we've got any healthy bone underneath and what our base looks like to proceed from there with a plan. And this is our day in the operating room. 
So we start by washing everything. I leave all of the healthy granulating and epithelialized tissue that I can intact and use a burr to burr down the bone just to get that nutmeg appearance and the punctate bleeding and ensure that all of that bone is healthy and can take a graft. But that's not a very good contour for a skin graft. And he also had not yet agreed to a skin graft. And so in this case, I used an umbilical cord graft again and placed it over both the bone and the granulation tissue and tucked it under the edges where I could. But I didn't elevate any of the surrounding tissues or make any advancement maneuvers at that time. And again, I placed a bolster dressing just as I would over a skin graft and left that sewn in place for one week. And when he comes back to my office, there's still some of the graft left in the wound. You can see that at the base on the right side of that wound um, specifically. And we're starting to get a little bit more epithelialization around the edges. And then I place another occlusive dressing and see him again at two weeks. And again, we have improvement, no huge decrease in size at this point, but things are starting to epithelialize and about half of it's recovered and totally epithelialized at four weeks. And at this point, what you see that's not epithelialized is about two by four millimeters, which is hard to appreciate in these photographs. And it's at this point, four weeks after our trip to the operating room and about five weeks after I met the patient where he says, okay, doc, you can skin graft this. Well, I don't need to skin graft at two by four millimeter wound. So we just kept doing local wound care and at six weeks, he's completely healed. What's interesting in particular about the appearance of this scarring is that he's got these lacy sort of reticular areas circumferentially around the wound where he's been healing by secondary intention. And I'm not sure if it translates well, but he's got these sort of rolled in borders and a step off. The portions in the middle that have healed over the umbilical cord graft and by secondary intention, they are more similar in color and they are at the same level as the surrounding scalp. So it would be interesting to see what would have happened to this wound in its entirety if we had started out um, with an umbilical cord graft from day one. That would have helped protect the bone as well in the meantime. But he's now doing quite well and happy with his result and back at work and hopefully not smoking. This is one of my trauma reconstruction patients. And this was my first encounter with her orthopedic surgeon who called me and said, I hear you take care of some of these complicated wounds and I have a lady to send you. And that's not how you usually want to meet a referring physician for the very first time. Usually you'd like to develop a relationship and have a couple of successes before you take on a really difficult case, um, which she turned out to be. She had had um, a patellar tendon an injury and repair with a braided permanent suture um, and was closed primarily by her orthopedic surgeon. She had type 2 diabetes, she was obese, significant protein malnutrition, and probably her biggest risk factor is that she's a wound care nurse. So she's used to dealing with these things and helping other people and you know, no good deed goes unpunished. And when you're in healthcare, you're usually looking at a more complicated case for whatever reason. And so she had a one month prior undergone her tendon repair and was one week out from a washout for a dehiscence um, by her orthopedic surgeon. And he washed everything out and reclosed it with these mattress sutures that you see here and sent her to me. And so we watched it initially, but since I could already see tendon in the base of the wound, we quickly got her on the operating room schedule and attempt to get that tendon covered with some healthy tissue. And so I took her to the operating room, opened up all of the sutures and was looking at a four centimeter square defect and did a little medially based adjacent tissue transfer and just swung that over. At that point, her preobumin was 30 and we thought, okay, we think she'll heal from this. And so frequently I'll use staples when I think there's gonna be a lot of swelling in an area so that the incision doesn't become ischemic once those sutures are tied tight. And so this often helps with perfusion to the skin edges. And then I applied an incisional wound back for her. 
I didn't use any placental based allografts in this first step because I, the wound looked clean and I wasn't really concerned about recurrence. We didn't have any tension on the flap. And I thought that we were dealing with somebody capable of healing given her pre albumin at that time. And this is her one week post op when I see her in the office and take down the incisional back. At two weeks, I am less confident in how this wound is going to progress. And at three weeks, it's obvious that we're going to have a complete dehiscence again. And there's some more investigation that needs to be done. Something's going on with this wound. It doesn't look quite right. She's got this erythema over her kneecap. Um, no real signs of infection other than that. No purulence in the wound. But I want to take a closer look at things. And so we actually get her admitted to the hospital for surgery quickly because I'm trying to protect that tendon repair. And we take her in, get her started on IV antibiotics. She's got MRSA growing in the wound. On our first trip to the operating room, which you see in the beginning, and I take her once a week for washouts in addition to using a Veriflow wound back that's perfusing uh, the entirety of the wound with normal saline and irrigating and washing that out um, continuously when the wound back is not on continuous suction. And this is how she progresses over the next several weeks until finally a discussion with the orthopedic surgeon sort of demonstrates that we really need to get that permanent suture out because her cultures are not changing at all and we're not gaining any headway despite tailored IV antibiotics and all of these debridements. And so the orthopedic surgeon allows me to take out the permanent suture and we just keep the knee in full extension to protect his repair um, for the foreseeable future. And once we get negative cultures, then I'm confident that I can get this wound closed and keep it closed. And in her, I'm trying to avoid a major muscle flap and something huge and bulky and debilitating um, over this area because I don't think it's necessary and it's not going to help her function in the long term. So once the wound is clean, I designed um, a laterally based flap in addition to my original medially based flap, which was re-elevated. Both of these were advanced to the midline. And I again placed umbilical cord directly over the tendon. I just wanted to give it an extra layer of protection and something to glide on underneath that repair in case it tried to scar down to the tendon underneath. And then placed a wound vac. I wasn't able to get the medial and lateral donor sites closed primarily. So we had a wound vac in that defect and incisional vac over the midline of her knee. And this is her at six weeks, eight weeks, and 12 weeks postoperatively. And she is, by two months, she's walking without any assistance at all. She's got full range of motion of her knee. She's no longer in extension and goes on to heal completely without any residual um, ambulatory deficits or residual wound. And she's quite happy with how things went. This is, this is a much different case. This is one of the trauma cases that I thought was going to end in amputation. And this is truly the case that made me a believer in the placental-based allograft products for difficult cases, difficult wounds, and difficult patients. Um, and so I will ask you to forgive me about the quality of my pictures. I truly thought this was going to be an amputation. And so I wasn't as particular as I usually am about getting nice intraoperative photographs for you guys. And I'm not backed up enough on the camera. And so it's hard for you to appreciate that we're looking at the anterior lateral aspect of the patient's ankle, just proximal to the malleolus. And this is a very pleasant 68 year old gentleman who was up in a tree cutting branches off and fell 10 feet. And at the time, originally had a Gustio 3A tibial fracture and his orthopedic surgeon washed everything out, placed an IM nail and was able to close the original wound. And the patient was wrapped up and sent to um, a rehab facility where the dressing was not removed for the next two weeks. And he presented back to his orthopedic surgeon's office with foul odor, purulent drainage and gross infection with dehiscence of the closure and some necrosis of the soft tissue. And 
it was grossly infected. The patient was taken to the operating room by his orthopedic surgeon and washed out, but then he was left with the equivalent of a Gestio 3B wound and the absent forceps there is pointing at an exposed fracture at the distal aspect of the wound. And we were already behind the curve with this patient um, given his poorly controlled type two diabetes, significant malnutrition that was just obvious in general and looking at him also and checking his pre-albumin levels. He had vascular disease with a 70% blockage of his tibioperineal trunk. Typically in a case like this, I would use a free muscle flap reconstruction, but he was not a candidate. Usually I like to bring in healthy soft tissue with a good blood supply to cover a fracture line that's exposed, especially if there's hardware in place that can't be removed. And especially um, when there's already infection that we're trying to get control of. IV antibiotics are not as helpful when you don't have a well perfused coverage of the wound to deliver those antibiotics locally. And so at the time of my first debridement, I was sort of at a loss for what I was going to do for this gentleman, given my inability to perform my go-to reconstruction for him. And that is the top of the reconstructive ladder, but it is also the reconstruction that's most guaranteed to save this man's leg. And because I don't perform amputations and because we didn't discuss that for this operation, I thought, what can I do um, to sort of temporize this wound, protect this bone, protect this fracture line, get some coverage of it, keep it sterile. Um, and then we'll have these talks when I see them in my office, depending on how things look. And so this was my first trial of the umbilical cord graft, which I placed in the wound and sewed it in just as I would um, a full thickness skin graft with chromic suture circumferentially, and then placed a wound back over it, which I don't have a picture of, um, and then brought him back to the office a week later with his family to have a discussion about how the wound was looking and you know what we could possibly do to save his foot. And when he came to the office, you can still see that there's graft in the wound bed. I can no longer see the fracture line, although I can't say definitively that it's covered because there is still graft in the bed. You can still see my chromic sutures there in place. And so we started the amputation discussion and said, let's give it another week and come back, see what happens. We don't have any gross infection right now. You seem to be getting better. We involved physical therapy and employed some lymphatic massage to keep swelling out of the area and keep things as well perfused as possible. And then brought him back to the operating room at two weeks. And now once everything is sort of cleaned up, there's no more graft left at the base of the wound and I can no longer see a fracture line. Nothing about this wound looks infected. He doesn't have any leukocytosis and no erythema surrounding it. And we're making progress with some nice granulation and the wound is beginning to shrink. And so, we decided that we would continue down this path until either it stopped improving or it was healed um, and we would proceed with caution and just a lot of close observation and reapplication of graphs until we got to a nice finishing point. And um, I should point out that, again, his bone is denuded. He doesn't have any periosteum um, or peritenon on that anterior tibial tendon that you see exposed in the wound. So that's additional concern for granulation, granulation tissue growing in over this wound bed um, in a timely fashion. But we proceed as I described, and this is five weeks in, the tendons covered. This is again in my office. And we continue to proceed 10 weeks, 11 weeks, and at 12 weeks, I'm able to place a full thickness skin graft. And this is him at 13 weeks with a 100% take of his skin graft, no evidence of infection. And at this point, it looks like a win. And then we see him back at six months. And at six months, it was quite difficult to get him back into the office for follow-up because he had planned to be in Mexico and so cut his trip a little bit short, but he had taken a bus down to Mexico to be in a dance competition um, on a leg that I thought we were going to amputate, you know, seven months prior. So 
this was my first real unexpected win with the use of human umbilical cord and what convinced me that it was a nice adjunct for these cases that were not straightforward and had multiple reasons to fail it gives these patients a shot. And that concludes the plastic surgery portion and I'll turn it over to the next faculty member. Hello everyone and thank you for joining me. I'm Biddy Das. I'm a colorectal surgeon at the Colorectal Clinic of Houston and with UT Physicians, McGovern Medical School. And I'm an assistant professor of colorectal surgery. And I'd like to talk to you guys today about placental-based allografts and their use in general in colorectal surgery. One of the reasons I'm such a proponent of these allografts is because we are moving away from the world of fibrosis and moving to regenerative technologies and regenerative healing. And the idea with regenerative healing is that we are replacing those same cells rather than creating fibrosis and moving away from inflammation to regeneration. And that's a concept that is actually fairly foreign to non-colorectal surgeons and non-general surgeons, but is well thought of in bone, joint, and spine literature, particularly with the use of platelet-rich plasma and other types of biologic materials. And I've tried to be at the forefront of this technology as it's utilized in the clinical day-to-day. -day. One of the reasons I think it has a large scope is because all of our surgical patients suffer from some of the same things. I often say that when we use placental-based allografts, we are dealing with cells, signals, and scaffolds. And you need all of those things to be there. And in our sick patients who are smokers, morbidly obese, suffering from cancer, suffering from infectious issues, suffering from chronic wounds, they lack one or all of those three things that allow us to supplant them and help the patient heal by using placental-based allografts, by supporting the structure with an extracellular matrix, the cells by having stem cell recruitment, and the retention of signaling cascades in the placental-based allografts. So I practice within a large scope of colorectal disorders, from things as benign as constipation to things that are as aggressive as advanced Crohn's disease with substantial amounts of colon cancer or a high colorectal cancer stage four burden. All of these things are possible and all these things are real in the real world and they require an extra level of attention to treat those cells, signals, and scaffolds. And that's why I feel like these patients fit the scope so perfectly for the use of biologic allografts, such as placental-based allografts. In our world, and why the scope matters, is because in the world of colorectal surgery, there are extensively dangerous complications like big problems, like anastomotic leak. However, there are a host of incredibly difficult smaller problems to deal with, namely fistula and ano, pilonidal disease, which are highly recurrent, perineal wounds that are very difficult to close because of radiation damage, chronic inflammation, chronic infection, or even the complex incision in a morbidly obese patient, despite our best attempts at closing with a minimally invasive issue. There's also an element of economic scope, and I'll get into that. So I mentioned that I'm trying to work in the forefront of biologic allografts and their application in general in colorectal surgery, because that field has been relatively void of the use of biologic allografts. Well, my aha moment came from the use of the platelet-rich plasma when I specifically used it around an anastomosis, and I saw a circumferential leak that was sealed without any intervention, no drain, and simply the use of antibiotics. I'd like to tell you about that as a lead-in to what got me interested in placental-based allografts. So speaking on the economic aspect, the failed gastrointestinal anastomosis is quite frankly a catastrophe. And the mortality rate in the literature is in the 10 to 15% range. Mortality, the amount or cost for a left-sided anastomosis in the colon to fail is almost a quarter million dollars when it comes to ICU care, rehabilitation care, 
and also the care needed to provide those critical life-saving measures and reoperations and repeat drains that all might be required, not to mention potentially an, an intracutaneous fistula or colocutaneous fistula and its closure. So speaking of my first leak, it was a post-op day eight patient that had a complex low interior resection, a smoker, a morbidly obese patient, and I had applied a platelet-rich plasma compound to the anastomosis. When the patient called and said she was having high fever, she was becoming mildly delirious. She came in and a contrast study demonstrated a circumferential contained leak. Well, because it was in the middle of our usual window, I felt like this could be a leak in evolution. And unfortunately, that leak in evolution might also get worse. But in fact, the anastomosis held and sealed. And I even was able to perform an earlier than usual endoscopy, demonstrating absolutely no disruption, no stenosis, and no residual leak or sinus tract whatsoever from the connection. It was there I realized that the use of these biologic additives can shift us from a fibrotic situation and help us even in incredibly dangerous times like this gastrograph and proven leak. And that's what got me interested. There are data to use these allografts in colorectal anastomosis. In fact, retrospective data was presented at the American Society of Colorectal Surgeons National Meeting that demonstrated a reduction in leak rate down to 25% of the original from four or 5% to around 1.2 to 1.3%. And you can see that the approach between laparoscopic or minimally invasive was, was reviewed. And they're actually fairly pattern matched with the exclusion of inflammatory bowel disease. They're actually cancer or other or inflammatory bowel disease or diverticulitis. Each of these cases, other than cancer, there was a great deal of inflammation and the leak rate was reduced retrospectively. However, there are pros and cons looking at this data. The pros are, well, we see a reproducible, two different surgeons that saw a similar leak reduction. And that's great. And that's, the, that's a great pilot study. And this study was actually repeated in a multi-center retrospective study later on that same year with additional data from a third colorectal surgeon independently evaluated and demonstrated that same decrease in leak rate for left-sided anastomoses. However, the cons are, it's really an underpowered study and we can do better. But as I said, this is the beginning of a new era in colorectal and general surgery, I hope. The way I use this in an anastomosis, this is a high risk patient, extreme smoker, could not stop or would not stop. And unfortunately had a near obstructing cancer that required urgent operation. And I was able to approach it with a reduced port slash advanced SILS technique effectively, I was able to wrap the anastomosis, and I'll show you how I do it. Effectively, I grasp an amnion graft, in this case, this placental allograft. I notice the way that I fold it reduces the tensile strength, and I'll advance the video just a touch. I enter my reduced port extraction. Notice I use the air seal port to keep insufflation and also uh, not change the profile of my appliance for the single incision. And I've created an iliocolonic anastomosis for an extended right colectomy. And I'll actually wrap it and place it around that anastomosis to create that immunomodulation. But what are other high-risk areas? And really in this situation, it comes down to the use of placental allografts for high-risk chronic wound healing areas of colorectal surgery. And there are many classic ones, the most complex being fistula and ano, pilonidal disease also being extremely recurrent and extremely difficult to close, and also the complex perineal wound. What about the radiated APR in the older patient? What about a proctectomy in a patient that has extensive fibrotic fistulas? What about complex abdominal wounds in the morbidly obese? All of these things are extremely difficult in colorectal surgery because of the nature of bacteria, poor protoplasm, inflammation, all of which change the scaffolding, the cells, and the signals that are required for accurate healing and true remodulation, not just fibrosis. 
Fistula and anal are very complex and effectively are complex for many reasons because they are circuitous tracts that go through the sphincter muscle and are very dangerous to continents if treated inappropriately. And they can also be highly persistent. Not only is there a mechanical pressure gradient, there is also a bacterial pressure gradient. And there's also a great deal of difficult, different ways to treat a fistula and anal. And in particular, there is no consensus on how to treat. Should we do an anodermal flap, an endorectal flap, biologic graft? And fundamentally, our goal is to cap the inside hole of these fistulas. One thing that's to note, the success rate of closure is very poor in the literature and varies wildly. And on average is 60 to 70%. So how do I do it? I've been able to achieve in my hands about an 80 to 90% success rate using a placental allograft as a buttress to my closure. And I can also add another placental-based allograft or a powdered graft in the tract, sometimes acting as an additional plug. A traditional endorectal advancement flap is available to see here. And effectively, what you do is core out the internal opening, close the internal opening, create a trapezoidal or rhombic, as you were, uh, endorectal advancement flap using the mucosa, the submucosa, and classically a slip of the internal sphincter. This same technique is, is demonstrated here. Here they've resected a portion of the internal opening in the mucosal flap and have sewn it down. And notice the fistula tract is left open after it's curetted to remove the epithelialized tissue. And some people argue if that's even necessary because by closing the pressure gradient, you have nothing else except granulation to fill in the residual wound. Another way is the anodermal advancement flap. And this is one that's very popular in our practice in Houston because we have the belief that with that great tensile strength of the dermal layer, you can get better apposition and the flap has such great tensile strength at the dermal layer that it's better able to close the internal opening. And you can see in both of these diagrams, different methods of advancing the external anodermal skin into the anal canal to close the internal opening. And I'll demonstrate that here. Here's a picture of a Parks retractor and that rubber band is a seton looping through a transphenteric fistula. I create a small submucosal dissection on the internal aspect. I removed the seton and demonstrated the transphenteric nature of the fistula and that white sheen on the inside around the lacrimal probe is the submucosal dissection. Again, I'm showing that from a different angle so it's a little more obvious. I'm gonna delineate my flap and I've already closed the internal opening, by using that submucosal dissection, I've closed the internal sphincter to close the internal opening. I'm delineating my flap just as you saw in those diagrams. That's the purple ink. I'm dissecting my flap and notice it's already mobile once I release it from the subcutaneous tissue and from the other dermal layers. And now what I'm going to do is before I oppose my flap and use my flap inset, I'm going to incorporate a folded sheet of placental allograft. And I'll do this by effectively taking a bite of my flap, a bite of my allograft, and then the inset native tissue to allow it to parachute in almost like a valve. And by parachuting in, I can close my entire flap over the internal opening that I've closed with a layer of placental allograft to further allow me not only to have that apposition and some slight increase perhaps in tensile strength, but to also have all the availabilities of an extracellular matrix and a chronic wound healing area, a scaffold obviously, cell signaling, and robust cells in a chronic irritated wound that has a pressure gradient, a mechanical pressure gradient, and a bacterial pressure gradient. I have about an 80 to 90% success rate. I use the graft as a buttress. And you can also fill the outer orifice if you're concerned that your outer orifice or your external opening is extensive. You can also fill a large abscess cavity. What about the complex perineal wound? Those are extremely difficult to close, particularly because of radiation, destroying your extracellular uh, matrix, 
presumably at least temporarily, or at least with the ebb and flow of radiation. Chronic inflammation destroying cell signaling pathways and cells themselves destroying the structure and fistulizing abscesses from Crohn's that can make it extraordinarily difficult to close these wounds. In each of these cases, you've destroyed one of the three components that creates prolonged wound healing in all of these cases. Here's an example of how I do it. I have an 85-year-old patient who already underwent prostate radiation but had a large, bulky distal rectal cancer invading the sphincter. We actually did super boost chemo radiotherapy to the patient because we had a timeline in a multidisciplinary conference of removing the rectum in any case. So this patient was radiated in the rectal area twice effectively. There is the perineal dissection completed. And in the bottom, you can see those purple sutures. My finger is holding up the anterior aspect. The posterior aspect is me closing the levators. I'll show another picture up close. That's me closing the levators. You can see a small gap, which I'll leave um, close as well. You can see just in the beginning, I placed a sheet right over the levator closure. And I'm going to do the same thing by closing one additional layer and use the other half sheet of the placental allograft, again, in an interleaving fashion. So at major centers, patients who have this type of radiation almost never undergo primary reconstruction, and many fail. And what I mean by failure is they have a long-term wound vac, they have a long-term packing, they have delays in chemotherapy, and they have gaping open wounds, or as I mentioned, negative pressure devices placed on the wound for two weeks to two months. But in my case, I did a primary closure supported by these placental allografts, and here is the patient 10 days postoperatively. Now, you can see there's a little bumpiness to the skin, and you can see evidence of radiation on the, on the perineal skin, but there's no dehiscence. And certainly there's some asymmetry of the wound, but let's extend that to three weeks and see if that still lasts. So at three weeks, you can see that asymmetry is starting to flatten out, and there is a complete and almost completely healed incision with slight dehiscence of the skin only, but not of the soft tissues. And this again is a case of quote, super boost radiation as it were. So complete healing without dehiscence, the asymmetry is better, slight irritation. Now, how about the same patient with Crohn's disease who had diverted proctitis that required a completion proctectomy with some amount of as dormant as possible fistulizing disease and complete removal for lay people of the anal canal. I was not able to complete an intersphincteric proctectomy because of how aggressive these fistulae were despite diversion. So here's the patient post up seven days. Again, you can see a slight irritation, but notice no dehiscence. And you can notice that obviously I had to go very wide. I could not complete an intersphincteric proctectomy because of the watering can perineum that I was left with. And I had to resect a lot of that fibrotic tissue. Again, a different view. It's evident there are no exudative changes, but let's go to post update 21. Again, almost the same situation, low redness from sitting on the area, but you notice zero dehiscence. Complete wound healing, even in the setting of chronic inflammation, a change in the scaffold from fibrosis, extensive tissue destruction, which will change local cell signaling. Pilonidal disease is the bane of every general surgeon and colorectal surgeon because they're chronic perineal wounds from both, an, I say, geometry, the fascial planes drawing hair in, and the presence of hair in an anatomic location. They have up to a 75% recurrence rate, even with small recurrences. And there's so many methods to treat it surgically, but all of those surgical methods create complex wounds. Incision and drainage is an, op is an option, but again, you're creating an open wound in an infected field that changes the cell signaling. You can do a wide local excision, but again, you have a long-standing chronic wound with a chronic wound bed that has changed, particularly if there's residual granulation tissue. In my situation, I try to cut it off center. If I do a wide local excision, particularly for an aggressive, highly fistulizing local pilonidal disease, and I'll fill it with some placental allograft. And by using that space filling technique, I'm able to put a non-occlusive dressing that's, that doesn't shear. 
And I'm able to keep these patients shaved and without recurrence until they're able to get laser hair therapy and they heal faster without negative pressure therapy, which can be very difficult in the younger patient population when they have many things to do or other competing factors. For complex incision, incisional wounds, one of the biggest problems is the patient comes with a host of complications. Again, changing cell signaling, changing extracellular matrix scaffolding, and changing the cell type to a certain degree or decreasing neutrophil chemotaxis. And I think this is an optimal time to gather assistance in wound healing from biologic implantation of placental allografts. So in this case, we had a morbidly obese 53-year-old gentleman with ongoing diverticulitis who had a complicated case of perforation, had a percutaneous drain that we had subsequently removed, and he had a preference for a minimally invasive operation, as did we all. This is a picture of the inside after drain removal and six weeks of antibiotics with his infectious disease doctor watching over us. And you can see that there's a good amount of stricturing. The normal rectum is at the center of your screen, and there's a great deal of scarring just to get this picture. And ultimately, I was able to complete it with a minimally invasive multiport technique. And you can see he's a little hefty there. So in this case, we placed a small amount of placental allograft, a very conservative amount, in the incision. Now, here's why it's very difficult as a colorectal surgeon. You're taking out the dirtiest organ. It has to be transected not once, but twice to create an anastomosis, particularly minimally invasively. And what you're taking out is inherently ischemic and it must go through the abdominal wall. So in all those cases, you're creating multiple inoculants of the highest bacterial concentration. We use amniofix in this situation. So let's advance to post-op day 14. No additional antibiotics. So there's the usual, what we would say for skip guidelines. And you have a nicely healed incision that's starting to dissolve and disappear almost. Although I would say that's because we also employ a little bit of massage. We tell the patient to massage to rearrange the collagen fibrils. So I appreciate the attention, but in the big picture, if you remember nothing else, realize that I think that there is a substantial role for placental allografts in general in colorectal surgery for not only big problems like leak, which are incredibly costly, quarter million dollars, 10 to 15% mortality, and it can help with big issues. And they're incredibly dangerous. And frankly, how can you put a price on mortality? But they can also help with smaller problems that are very difficult to solve completely. Fistula and ano with a high recurrence rate of 30%, pilonidal disease with a recurrence rate of 45 to 75%, complex perineal wounds that require wound vax or negative pressure therapy or packing and delay post-operative chemotherapy or ongoing nutritional challenges in that patient that required perhaps a more urgent operation. And also, the incisional care of the patient, which is becoming more of a concern as we worry about our skip measures and skip guidelines and our SSI rates. I appreciate your kind attention. I've completed my presentation. I'll hand it off to the next speaker. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Anaitha Dua. I'm an assistant professor of surgery at the Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Um, I am associate director of our wound care center and co-director of our PAD center, as well as director of the vascular lab. Um, all really key portions to limb salvage, which is what I'm going to talk about with you today. Um, limb salvage specifically with a focus on placental-based allografts. So one of the big things that we talk about in limb salvage is diabetes, diabetes, diabetes. Why is it important? Because essentially at this point, diabetes is causing an epidemic across the world in the sense that we're having patients that are coming in once every 30 seconds across the, the world that ultimately end up getting their limb amputated. Now, what's interesting about limb salvage is that in limb salvage, it's not about just getting really good blood flow or getting a good offloading shoe or getting good antibiotics for the infection. It's a combination of everything that comes together in order to make sure that the limb is salvaged. So unfortunately, even though you may do one part great, for example, in diabetes, you may control the blood sugar amazing. If you don't do these other pieces, ultimately the marker, the limb salvage aspect of it is not always positive. So what I'm going to talk about with you today is really an overview of how you save a limb that is threatened. 
So as I discussed, there are really three major queens, things that you should think about when you're looking at a limb that needs to be salvaged. Number one, what is the blood supply? And whether that blood supply is allowing infection control agents, for example, antibiotics, to get to the area that may have a wound that is infected. Secondly, wound care, wound care, wound care. Because if you don't have a situation where the wound is thoroughly cleaned and appropriately debrided and is a good, healthy bed, never will that wound heal. And ultimately, the limb may not be salvageable. Next, you have to look at pressure offloading. Essentially, how do we take this wound that's healing and allow those baby cells to grow and allow the wound to be in a position where it gets to do nothing but heal? Because if you have a weight-bearing surface that you walk on, for example, that has infection and has an open wound, that's going to make the healing process very difficult and ultimately could result in the limb being lost. Now, there are different types of wounds that come when a patient has diabetes. The wound to the right, um, essentially this one here, is a neuropathic wound, a pressure wound. How do I know that? Well, it's really location. As a vascular surgeon, when I look at this, I think, look, these toes look beautiful. So what's going on here? Why would a wound form that's more proximal to the toes, and typically in a diabetic area, there's gonna be some hard callus and ultimately some wounds that form in the middle. And unfortunately, because this person continues to walk on this foot that may be a Charcot's foot and all the, the tendons are lax, this part of the foot is getting a lot of pressure. But I, as a vascular surgeon, really deal with this foot, the diabetic, who has all the issues of Asharko's foot, but also has ischemic injury. And this is the type of patient in which I really do prefer to use placental allografts, and I'll explain why. So let's go through the three queens quickly and talk about how each one can be optimized. And ultimately, we will talk about placental allografts, and I'll share with you a couple of cases that I have had positive experiences with and why I choose to use that particular type of wound care supplement. So starting with the blood supply, obviously I'm a vascular surgeon, I love this part, but it's equally important as the other two. There was a paper published by Dr. Joe Mills on behalf of the Society of Vascular Surgery that specifically looked at lower extremity guidelines. Now, the Wi-Fi classification is a special classification uh, system that really risk stratifies wounds based on things, including the wound class, whether or not there's ischemia to that location and whether there's wound infection. Why is this important? Because it allows you to tell, tell the patient what you are gonna to need to do for them in order for them to salvage the limb. So in terms of wound healing from the Wi-Fi classification in that paper by Dr. Mills, one of the most important graphs is this one. What this graph is showing is essentially that in order for a wound to heal on the toe of a diabetic foot, the toe pressure needs to be at least 55 mmHg. Now, why is that important? Because in diabetics, they have a lot of calcium within the tibials. In fact, in diabetics, calcium has a predilection for the tibial vessel. So a lot of times the ABIs or the ankle brachial indices are totally unreliable because when you put the blood pressure cuff up, it doesn't press down and doesn't give you a good reading. But the toe pressure will always be something that you can rely on that can tell you how well blood is getting down to the foot. Now, in diabetics, there's something very key that happens, and this is connected to the placental-based products that I'm going to talk to you about later. In diabetics, unfortunately, there's a predilection, again, for the diabetes to go after the microvasculature in the foot. So what does that mean? The teeny tiny itty bitty vessels that feed the tips of the toes, unfortunately, get destroyed. And what that results in is a toe pressure less than 55 and a capacity potentially for the wound not to heal. Just remember that as we move forward. So one of the things that we can do in order to help patients for limb salvage is something called deep venous arterialization. Deep venous arterialization is a new technique that um, essentially involves hijacking the uh, veins of the foot, taking blood supply from the arteries in the leg and connecting it to the veins in the foot so that the veins can deliver that arterialized blood to the distal aspect of the toes. We recently wrote this uh, uh, review about uh, deep venous arterialization that can be done either in an open or percutaneous or hybrid fashion. And the only reason I bring this up to you is that basically up until this point, amputation was really the only option for these patients. But nowadays, more and more, deep venous arterialization is being utilized in order to revascularize patients that otherwise 
would undergo an amputation. So the point is that there is a way to salvage these patients. It's not good enough to just say, oh, sorry, we're going to have to do an amputation on you. But remember, these are patients that come in with terrible wounds. So if you're going to do something like a deep venous arterialization where you're going to get blood supply to the foot and that takes time to mature, in the meantime, you need to do something about that wound so that it doesn't turn into a festering mess and force you to amputate the leg because you were unable to control the infection. So long story short, if you're going to be doing something heroic to attempt to salvage a leg, for example, deep venous arterialization, ensuring that offloading and wound products are appropriate to get that foot to a point where the new arterialized vein is mature enough is really important. The pedal loop is another aspect that we look into basically to allow more blood flow to get down to the tips of those toes. The pedal loop essentially is a loop that forms between the posterior tibial artery and the anterior tibial artery. Just right here, so posterior tibial comes around like this, forms a loop with the anterior tibial. In a lot of patients that are diabetics, this loop may no longer exist. And as a result, the offshoots that go to the toes may not exist. So there is a way in which one can get into the pedal loop using different techniques in order to actually open up that loop using endovascular procedures. You don't want to make a cut on these patients because now you would potentially put a wound in a place that will never heal. But from an endovascular standpoint, you could potentially come from the top and come from below and try to connect these two lumens in order to give you good flow. There are, these are basically just ways in which you can achieve that. One of my favorites is actually coming up and down from up below and above and basically inflating a balloon to kind of shatter this area and allow for one single lumen of flow. So where are we with pedal artery revascularization in 2021? We re recently wrote this uh, discussion essentially about below the knee disease and talked about the fact that for wounds specifically, wound healing rates are better in patients who had both tibial and pedal artery disease treated successfully. Why do I harp on this? Because the point I'm making is in this day and age, we have so many phenomenal techniques to get blood supply where it needs to go to heal these wounds and salvage these legs. But you need a combination in a person of not only the ability to salvage the limb from an endovascular standpoint and a knowledge of vascular surgery, but knowing about wounds and knowing about offloading so you can really be the triple threat and save these legs. The other thing that uh, is important to consider is PAR or pedal artery revascularization should be considered for patients in whom optimum healing is not occurring after you do a successful tibial intervention. Why? Because again, in diabetic patients, tibial disease may go all the way down to the toe. So even if you get great blood flow to the ankle, who cares? You didn't get blood to the wound bed. And as a result, the wound cannot heal. But in a patient that potentially has good successful tibial recanalization, looking into whether the pedal loop may be an option is key. So now let's talk a little bit about wound care. Wound care is the other giant gun after blood supply. If you do not take care of the wound, and some vascular surgeons are guilty of this, you know, you get a beautiful, a uh, phenomenal angiogram at the end of your case. You think you've done great, but you cover that wound up and you don't send the patient for appropriate wound care. You don't make sure that they've got good offloading and you have to amputate that leg because you, they ended up getting a necrotizing infection. So just a little history about wound healing. So the original, original kind of concepts for wound healing, at least in the States, come from the Civil War, where the wet to dry concept came into play. Now, I want you to think about that, the Civil War. So that's a long time ago. And we definitely have advanced in vascular surgery. So wound care really should advance as well. In World War I, changing dressings basically fell into the domain of the physicians. In fact, changing dressings was a crucial part of what a physician did. By the 1930s, we had patients um, that were both treated by physicians and by nurses. And essentially, as the 80s evolved, we started to see the beginnings of what would become modern wound care. We started to see transparent film dressing, hydrochloroids were used for the first time. And then in 2019, we got a new breakthrough with amniotic tissue. Now, what's so special about amniotic tissue? Well, I'll get to that in a second, but the big thing is, saving money. And that may sound counterintuitive, but I'll explain that in a moment. Essentially, everyone says wounds cost money, wounds cost money. And guess what? They are right. 
Wounds cost money, a lot of money, huge cost, big business. But what most people are surprised to know and what most people are wrong about is that the cost of wounds does not come from wound care products. This is fact. This is, this is data-driven information. Wound care costs come from the material cost to some extent, but really this is what drives wound care costs. You have a patient with repeated hospitalizations. You have a VNA that's coming to the house again and again and again and again. So how do you drop this cost? You heal that wound by whatever means it takes as fast as possible. So the biological components or the idea of amniotic tissue has been around for a little while. As I mentioned, in 2019, it really started to take over. And there's been a lot of data published about the fact that there, that there is something within placental tissue that's rich in cytokines and growth factors and allows for this wound healing environment where growth can actually occur. Essentially, um, there have been clinical trials that have been done looking to see where, in what disciplines we've seen placental products and we've noticed it across the board. And essentially, regardless of whether you're talking about teeth or you're talking about diabetic wounds, there is data to support that the placental derived cells or amniotic tissue does indeed assist with wound healing. In the classic situation we see it in is burns. When you have a patient that has a nice big burn and you take a piece of placental tissue and you use it as covering in a patient, kind of creating this wound bed for an ultimate graft, that really gives you a nice moist environment that also allows for wound healing to occur. But what about the diabetic foot? Because remember, the difference between a diabetic foot and a burned foot is that the diabetic foot has no blood supply. So while there is a huge body of literature that's out there, over 300 articles talking about amniotic membrane, the fact of the matter is for the vascular surgeon, for the limb salvage specialist, how does this help me? Because as a limb salvage specialist, it's really important for me to make sure that whatever I do to these patients ultimately is going to result in wound healing. So if the blood supply is bad in a patient and I can't get it perfect, just putting a piece of tissue on it is not going to help me. There's something very unique I use placental tissues for, and I'll explain that in just a second. So here I just want to bring to your attention the different types of wounds, and as you can see, diabetic ulcer in here, and the different types of articles, this is from a paper, um, that really looked to see whether or not uh, amniotic tissue did indeed affect wound healing. And every single one of these manuscripts, that was a positive finding, that indeed, regardless of these different types of wounds, it appeared that placental tissue did in fact end with a good outcome. And when they looked at cost, in the cost analysis, it was found that patients essentially on average that have a healed diabetic foot ulcer in the amniotic membrane group was about $1,517. But a patient in one year that did not heal their wound, the estimated cost was $28,000. And again, the reason for this is because the cost comes from hospitalizations and VNA. So cost as a, as a concept is really not applicable for the placental-based stuff if you're doing it right. I agree. If you have a patient where the wound's not going to heal, and you just keep banging placental graft after placental graft, and ultimately you've got to amputate this patient or the wound breaks down, of course, that's not ideal. That's the worst of both worlds. But if you have good patient selection and you apply the amniotic tissue early on a clean bed, ultimately by healing that wound, you absolutely will increase the aspect of limb salvage and simultaneously decrease the cost. The other big aspect, and I, I, I'll get to um, finally what I meant about wound care and uh, placental-based grafts specifically for diabetic wounds at the end, but the other major element here is offloading. So there are a variety of offloading shoes that once you place your placental graft or your regular graft or your wound care dressing or anything, and you've done an angiogram, you do not want pressure on the area of the wound. There are multiple different casts and different types of ways in which you can ensure that you don't get major impact to the area of the wound. And the key in these patients, sometimes even our podiatry colleagues will cast, literally put a cast on the patient to ensure that they offload. Just remember, sometimes the patient may not be reliable and it's dangerous to put a cast on someone that you don't think is going to come back to remove that cast. So as long as you're sure that this is a reliable patient and has the appropriate social uh, situation to be able to take care of that cast, that's a great way to utilize casting. So now I want to talk very specifically about one particular question that I answer day in and day out, which is in the diabetic foot that I'm trying to limb salvage that does not have great blood supply. How do I use these placental products for limb salvage? And this is the key. 
I use them as a bridge. So what do I mean by that? Skin grafting is kind of the end all be all in the sense that for years and years and years, plastic surgeons, general surgeons, vascular surgeons have taken pieces, split thickness graft of skin from other aspects of the body and placed them on top of wound beds in order to cover the wound. There's no question that a good skin graft is worth its weight in gold. But the problem with the diabetic patient is if you're going to put someone through a skin graft, you're going to put them through surgery where you take a piece of their flesh under anesthesia and you place it in another location and it's going to take time for that to heal. You better be sure that you put them through all of that for a reason. The worst thing that can happen is you do the skin graft, you put it on the patient's leg, and unfortunately the graft doesn't take because your blood supply wasn't appropriate or because your wound bed doesn't have enough granulation tissue because again, this is a diabetic foot and it has microvascular disease. So what I do is I take placental product. I will create a wound by doing an amputation, debriding a large wound, and once I'm ensured that it's clean, there's no necrotic tissue in there, but the wound has slow growth. I will place an amniotic piece of tissue over the top of that wound, sometimes with a vac on the top of that. And what I will do is wait. And if I need to place another piece of amniotic tissue in approximately 10 days, I'll do that again, especially if it's a deep wound. For example, a toe amputation site where I literally have the bone sticking out at me and I'd like to put something in there to try to get that wound to heal up. In these cases, I will place an amniotic piece of tissue and I will try to nurse that wound to a point where potentially it may need a skin graft. And you would be surprised at how many of these patients don't even need a skin graft because they basically will granulate in with the vac and the placental tissue. However, if it's not perfect and doesn't granulate all the way in, you certainly can create a wound bed that now has a much better chance of being able to take that skin graft. So I had a patient actually that I, I actually just saw um, who came in to see me with a necrotic foot infection where essentially I had to uh, open up the um, necrotic tissue that was within the patient's leg and place a drain all the way through the patient's leg in order to allow for draining to occur to try to salvage. After I let the wound really drain and the patient was on antibiotics, I did in fact debride it and place placental tissue as a sandwich on both sides of the wound. I packed the inside of the wound with placental tissue and then put pieces on the top of it. I saw the patient back every 10 days to see how the wound looked. And ultimately I was able to skin graft the part, the plantar aspect of the patient's foot and he successfully healed the wound. He now has a toe amputation site that is healed and a large scar at the bottom of his foot and the top of his foot, all of which have granulated in. The thing is, it took a very long time because he didn't have great blood supply. So in that long time, the graft didn't just die and fall off because I could keep putting placental tissue on again and again. So in conclusion, wound healing is an essential part of success of limb salvage. You cannot say that you salvage the limb just because the blood supply is fine. That is just one third of it, especially when you have advanced microvascular disease, because in that case, a standard angiogram where you basically allow angioplasty to the tibials is not sufficient. And you may need to do something to actually get good blood flow to the toes, like pedal loop intervention or like deep venous arterialization. Once you have gone through all this effort to get blood flow, just enough blood flow to that wound bed, offloading and infection control is fundamental along with wound care. And if you need something that's going to bridge you over while the wound slowly heals, nothing really is better than a good placental product because it gives you a great wound healing bed with evidence-based uh, information that supports the fact that this does in fact help wound healing and ultimately, if you do heal that wound, you certainly have kept prices low. Thank you very much. Now we'll go over to the Q&A. Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you for tuning in and sharing some of your time with us. We have some questions in our chat box and I'm gonna read those questions to our panel and have them answer some of these questions for you. Let's start with the first one. The first one is, are there any potential risk of hypersensitivity or allergic response to placental-based allograft products? Um, Dr. Das, can you, can you answer that one? 
Sure, I'd be glad to. I think that we always try to avoid saying never or always, but I think there have been virtually zero reported cases of hypersensitivity or allergic response to these type of allograft products. I think that in particular, they're specifically tested for hypersensitivity reactions because we know they are allograft-based products. Okay, great. Thank you. The next question, how common is it for patients to experience no pain or swelling after use of an amniocarion membrane during the first post-operative week? Dr. Dua, can you answer that one for us? Absolutely. I can tell you from uh, my anecdotal experience, I really have not had um, any patients that have had swelling or pain in the location of the graft because of the graft. I mean, it's one thing if I've done a revascularization, I'm a vascular surgeon, so I've done a revascularization on a patient and they might have some swelling from that. Um, and then I would cover the wound with a placental based graft because um, I don't want to go to a skin graft at that time or I want to see how the wound does with my new blood flow. Um, but I have not had any reaction to, to follow up on what Dr. Das as, as well said um, to the graft itself. Um, and I've, I've certainly not had a patient do anything like, you know, sometimes with zero form, even they'll just rip off the bandage because it burns or, you know, issues like that. I've not had a single patient do that. In fact, quite the opposite. I tell them to be careful and they're, they really treat the, the, the wound in the area very well. Yes. Well put. I think that's, that's exactly my, my experience also. Okay. Uh, we have another question. Are there any types of wounds in which you cannot directly apply an amnion chorion membrane? And since I do a lot of wound care, I'm going to take that one. Um, there really are not any wounds that you cannot apply this to. However, bear in mind that when you do apply this, the wound must be free of infection, must be debrided extensively down to a good granulation bed or to a point where you can grow a granulation bed. So you have to take good care of the wound, make sure there's blood supply, make sure it's free of infection, and make sure you have a thorough debridement before application of this product. Other than that, it can be applied to many, many different types of wounds over muscle, tendon, bone. I've applied it over all those things with, uh, with great success. Okay. I'm just, we, I'm just gonna add to that a little bit. Sure, please. Um, I've used it very successfully in infected wounds and used it specifically because I couldn't graft um, the infected wound bed. So it does work well in those circumstances as long as you've got a good blood supply and it's adherent to tissue that's got good flow so that it can actually do its job. Um, and then I agree with you on all the other points, but it is it has been very successful in infected beds. Okay. Anybody else want to comment on, uh, on that in yeah. wound care? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in. I'm a vascular surgeon as well. And I agree. I think you got to set yourself up for success. So, uh, you know, a lot of times you just want to slap something onto a wound and, and think it's going to work, but you know, you really need to make sure that, you know, you got as good a glycemic control as you can, as good a debridement as you can, make sure there's no fibrinous exudate, make sure that you get good apposition onto whatever you want to apply it onto it. You know, I think a lot of times <clears throat> we have these disaster wounds and we just expect that we're going to put a product on it. And it's going to work fine. It doesn't really work that way. You really have to set yourself up for success. So make sure that you can, you know, get as much source control as possible, at least from a vascular perspective. And, and then again, the plug for, for vascular is if you don't have the blood supply, it doesn't matter what, what you do. So yeah. I think it's important that, you know, you, 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 you look at all that. I, I see a lot of the, the patients that we see uh, that we get, they get referred for these wounds. And, you know, as a vascular, first thing I do, the ABI is like 0.2 or, you yeah. know, 0.35. You're like, well, you know, and then you find out there's all these other things that need to happen first. And then you're able to, you know, uh, deal with a wound appropriately. So I think that's very important. And and, and just to, to chime in a little bit about what what, what Anita said earlier. I, again, for me, anecdotally, the same thing. I really don't find that the patients complain of any pain or or, or issues with the application of the, of the particular placental based allograft. You know, outside of you know other you know surgery that was required prior to this. So in my personal experience, we really had a, a very good uh, success with its use, and, and the patients uh, you know are very happy with it. Primarily because sometimes it's used as an adjunct. To skin grafting, but sometimes we avoid a skin graft uh, or, or get good coverage. So I think, you know, they get very happy that they can avoid a further surgery if they, this skin substitute does the job. So. The skin graft donor side is where I've noticed the biggest improvement in their pain level in the post-operative period for my patients. 
I, I've also had a lot of uh, success with radiated tissue when uh, we do complex perineal wounds or an abdominal perineal resection for cancer. These patients are largely radiated as a neoadjuvant course before we proceed with their cancer resection. And so in a lot of the patients where you're closing a difficult perineal wound that traditionally is in a high pressure gradient area and has been exposed to the outside world and high bacterial load during surgery by virtue of dealing with the end of the intestine, one of the things that I've noticed is a decrease in perineal pain. So people don't even complain about the perineal pain like they used to, which is impressive. But I think that the remodulation that we're trying to see with uh, biologic therapy is actually coming to fruition, particularly in the radiated tissue bed. Um, and I think that's something that is a tissue subtype, a radiated bed, that I think that this is a excellent match for. Um, I'm going to comment on the pain, pain issue also, because I've used it in, in elective surgery to cover over bone and then to cover superficially as I close. And I've noticed that these patients in particular have much less pain and the much, much, much most often do not need medication for pain control afterwards to the extent that patients in which we have not used this product. So I've had great success with using it in deep structures and superficially, and it's a great adjunct to pain control. So we've, I've had great success with it also. Okay. We, we got everybody covered on that. All right, let's go to the next question and we'll just have everybody chime in on this. Do you believe that placental-based allografts will play a larger role in decreasing complications of surgeries such as adhesion formation. Who wants to take this lead on that one? So as the intra-abdominal surgeon, that's, that's something we do a lot of. I think that uh, this, this day, there, there are actually a number of small studies that demonstrate placental-based allografts have actually decreased pelvic adhesions. So I do think that in shifting from an inflammatory response to a regenerative response around the use of these allografts, particularly in the abdomen, will also decrease the amount of adhesion formations, and we've seen that before. Whether they'll play a larger role in decreasing complications as adhesions, I think they'll decrease, I think they will play a larger role in decreasing adhesion formation to critical anastomoses or to critical structures. For example, if you have a J-pouch reconstruction or a complex endometriosis case, I think those are things that we are very concerned about adhesion prevention, particularly in the fertility uh, aspect. And those are great use cases for placental-based allograft tissue. Anybody else want to chime in on that, on uh, decreasing the complications of surgery and, uh, and or adhesion formation? As a plastic surgeon, I generally try to stay out of the abdomen altogether, but I do think it changes the scarring profile and how wounds heal. So when you have to go back and reoperate on them, you've got a much nicer um, plane to work with than something that's scarred down. I, I, um, <clears throat> I, I can't speak to personal experience yet because I, I haven't had to redo a, a groin, but I, I've uh, in these patients, but I, I have applied it in, in a very short um, a proportion of patients uh, in the in the in the inguinal region in the femoral region uh, but i haven't had to go back and do a redo and hopefully i don't but it's vascular surgery but so i'll be able to give you guys more information about that at a later date but uh, I, I i applied it hoping that if i had to go back down it wouldn't be too scarred or too fibrotic but but i haven't had to do that yet in the patients that i applied it so i'm curious if, if i may ask to our vascular surgeons on the panel I've always thought that groin dissection would be a fantastic place for this use, um, not just for adhesion formation as the question derives, but also because think about lymphocele, think about inflammatory changes in the groin, all of those things, or the predisposition to pseudoaneurysm formation. It would be nice to see a longer term uh, evaluation, but I was curious about your use in the groin. Have you seen any of those changes relative to your other obese smoker vasculopath patients? 
No, I actually, I mean, Jai, you can take that first. Like, I, I have not um, um, used it myself in the groin. And now, you know, even hearing this conversation, I'm starting to think maybe even from an anastomosis standpoint, you know, or putting it between the artery and the vein and the groin, because that's where you get into trouble when you come back for a redo. And, um, but, um, you know, to your point about like these obese patients where the groin infection and blow out of the patch, you know, for example, an ephemeral end art is like the bane of our lives. Um, if something like this could potentially prevent that, you know, essentially create a layer from the uh, infection turning from just the superficial space into the deep space, that alone would make it worthwhile. Um, but again, you know, this is all speculation. I certainly haven't tried it. Um, but um, what I have done is, um, actually used pieces of amniotic tissue in, this is not for groins, but for like a, a, a BKA that's infected that I've revised, and then I'll close over the tissue. And, uh, you know, to Dr. Moab's point, I've not been back myself to do any surgery. So I don't know about adhesion formation, but I do know that the actual scarring and the way that it heals is much better, especially if I can place a vac on top of uh, um, wherever I place the graft. Um, and uh, so to my plastic surgery colleague, Dr. Clark, I wonder if you've seen that in some of your patients and if you agree that that might be something that, you know, would be a good use of this product. Yeah. And, and so I've used it in a lot of enclosures um, and use it in deep spaces well, relatively deep um, and superficially. And I think it really changes how quickly they heal and how they scar. And I do use it with an incisional back um, most of the time, as long as I can. I think that um, those are all great answers. And I think from my experience, I think even one of the case studies that I presented earlier in the presentation, um, I've used these specific products to to prevent adhesions in, in the joint remodeling procedure where there have been adhesions before to put this into the joint so that we can prevent adhesions and maintain the correction that we have on the operating room table for that patient for many years to come. Indeed, that's been my experience in that using it in, in joint surgery, we, we reduce the adhesions that we normally would get, uh, normally expect to have, and therefore the patients are much happier because they have restored joint function. We use it around tendon repair all the time for the very reason that we don't want tendons to become tacked down via adhesions postoperatively and allows the tendon to slide back and forth in the tendon sheath very nicely. So I think the, the adhesion question is, is pretty huge. I think we've all, we all agree that this is, uh, gives us a feel more favorable outcome when it comes to the complications of surgical adhesions. So that's great to hear. Uh, let's go to another question that we have. Uh, do you believe that the amniofix placental-based allograft will replace the need for skin grafts in some patients? Dr. Clark, you can take the lead on that one. So I don't think it will necessarily replace the need for skin graft, um, but not all patients are candidates for skin grafts who need wound closure. So I think it's a very useful adjunct to get wounds healed faster that you can't get rid of by just skin grafting them right away. So I think it's a nice adjunct and it certainly has benefits and it's beneficial to use it with the skin graft if you're worried that it's not gonna take in a patient for some of their comorbidities. Um, but I don't think it's gonna replace it altogether. I, I don't think it will replace either, but I, I uh, oh, sorry, Dr. Dewey. No, 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 please, please, please. I bet we're going to say the same thing. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's going to replace it, but I can tell you for us, my, my goal when using it was to prepare a bed for a skin graft. And I can tell you in a variety of patients, I didn't have to skin graft them because it actually held, uh, healed up secondarily. So, uh, you know, my, my goal was always to just prepare it appropriately to, to, to get a skin graft on it. But I've been pleasantly surprised in, in some wounds really it just became a very small, um, it healed up secondarily and really we didn't have to apply a skin graft or the wound became so small, it just wasn't worth you know, making a donor site for a skin graft, so. I recently had a patient that refused a skin graft because he just, he couldn't figure out whether or not he trusted me. And he took so long <laughs> to trust me that I healed the wound with Amniofix. <laughs> and he, by the time he was ready for a graft, it was a two millimeter wound. And I was like, well, now you don't need a skin graft. <laughs> We're done here. Great. I think that um, I think I've had a similar experience where many of these wounds that normally would have gone to a skin graft heal very quickly and therefore don't need the skin graft. So 
Um, they do, it does um, accentuate the healing process, which, which oftentimes means that these patients do not have to undergo the grafting procedure. So, um, so that's been very helpful. Um, we have another question here. The difference in efficacy from a refrigerated or frozen product and that is kept at room temperature or, or other products. Um, any experience with, with other tissue products that we can talk about? Have you all seen a difference in, the, in, in refrigerated or frozen products as compared to off-the-shelf products? I haven't actually None. seen a difference between it, but I, I will say just the, you know, the surgeon's minute waiting for things to thaw <laughs> alone is enough to say, you know, and then, you know, we've got to, there's, it's not, there's more about the logistics, at least where I work, you know, logistics are a big deal, freezer space, things like that are a big deal. And so being able to get these products in ease of use, um, especially if you're going to, you know, it's one thing to put it in the operating room, obviously someone like Dr. Das is doing it, you know, intraoperatively, you're obviously in the OR and your OR products are there, but for my patients, you know, I, I'll, I'll put it on, but then I might have to do another application a week later, another application, you know, a couple while I'm waiting to see if I took that ABI from 0.2 to 0.5, was it sufficient? Is this wound going to heal? And it's nice not to put a skin graft on and, you know, waste the graft in the sense that I might have to take it off or it doesn't take because the blood supply is not good enough. But to go back to, you know, being able to keep something off the shelf and easily grab it and um, have it available if I need to put on repeat applications, that is a, a game changer, right? Because now it allows me to get the patient, you know, you can't, you can't say a product failed if you didn't use it right. And if something requires a few applications and I'm not going to take this patient back to the operating room six times for, you know, a toy amp site that's not closing, right. um, that makes uh, all the difference, I think. So it's just from a logistics standpoint, really nice, but I don't have any data to state that efficacy is better one way or the other. Anybody else want to chime in on this question? I think that in, there is, there's never been a head to head comparative study done. So it is, any information that we can, we can give is purely anecdotal. Um, these products are very effective in, in treating all the different things that we apply them to, both surgically and in the wound clinic. Um, there is the logistical challenge, which uh, our institution had. We had to get rid of our freezer because it just, it just was a logistical nightmare. And Jaco was on us like crazy, so that didn't work. But um, I think all in all, we understand that these products are extremely effective. And I think that in our presentations today, uh, we were able to demonstrate that. And I think with some of the questions that we've answered uh, from our personal experiences, we're also able to show that these products can do indeed change the way that we treat our patients and change what our expectations are as we make our patients better. So anybody else have anything to add? All right, excellent. I want to thank uh, our very distinguished panel here for their input and their help in covering this topic. And I want to thank our audience for joining us and taking some of your time to learn about these products. Thank you very much and uh, have a great day.